The career of Russell T. Davis, of course, didn't start with Doctor Who in 2005. The first show of his own that Russell created from the ground up was Dark Season, a six-episode 1991 children's sci-fi fantasy drama starring Kate Winslet, no less. In my spare time, I had written a series that was more to my taste, a science fiction thriller. It's a very interesting show, both on its own terms and for what it says about RTD and his style and his later work as a showrunner. Hello and welcome to Dark Season. Yeah, it's not Doctor Who, it's Dark Season, my very first drama, which went out 30 years ago, today, uh, 1991. Very exciting. And it's even getting a sequel in 2023. So we're going to have a good chat about it today, talking about where Dark Season came from and the start of RTD's career, talking about Dark Season's themes and ideas and setting and characters of the show itself, talking about the show's self-aware relationship with TV and pop culture, the juxtaposition of the mundane with the fantastic, what it meant to be making something like Dark Season in 1991, and all sorts of other stuff as well. So, to discuss Dark Season today, I'm joined by Bryn and by Oliver, both big RTD fans and both from England. Stand by for news on tomorrow's Live and Kicking coming up after more drama in Dark Season. So, uh, to start off, I'm going to ask both of you how you first heard about the show. So, Bryn, how did you first hear about Dark Season? Yeah, I mean, I've got quite a few um, books at this point on Russell T Davies's career, and it's always one of those names that comes up in there. And you know, it's I'm such a big Russell T Davies fan and have done for a long time. And as I started to watch more of his shows, I'd be looking at you know Wikipedia and IMDb and just scrolling back through and seeing what this um, this show was. So I've been aware of it for many years before I ever got round to watching it, or before um, Big Finish. Um, did um, their audio book of the novelization of it. And of course, Big Finish never let a property die. And so it's back. We've made an audio book with the original star of Dark Season, Victoria Lambert. So it's something that's been aware for me as a long time as a point that I would like to go back and watch, but it actually took me a long time to get around to it. I only watched it for the first time um, in the summer um, this, this year. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, what about you, Oliver? How did you come to Dark Season? I'm pretty certain that I probably bumped into it first on, like, a Wikipedia list. Um, RTD's got a lot of shows under his belt at this point. Um, and it was something that always interested me as the first one. I, he mentions it quite a few times in uh, interviews and, like Bryn's saying, it comes up a lot in the books about his work. But it's not something that I had actually sat down and watched before you know this it's always uh, rtd's early work i've always found a little bit less interesting than his later work so i didn't feel a massive draw towards it um but there's a lot more of his identity i think in the show than i would have expected considering it's um so early on in his career yeah i feel like queer as folk is probably the first show most of us knew of before we started like Wikipedia diving into his career, things like that. It feels like the first show of his that really broke through in uh, uh, 1999 and 2000. So his earlier stuff, it's almost like a pre-RTD in some ways. I think that's really, really interesting. How did you both find the show in the sense of like how much did you like it compared to his other work? I distinctly remember watching the first episode, you know, going into it as someone who's interested in RTD, both you know academically and just in terms of entertainment, enjoying his work. And when I finally sat down and watched the first episode, I remember not being instantly grabbed by it. To be honest, like I think watching hmm. first episode, one of the things that surprised me the most, I think, particularly interesting actually, is the comparison with Queer as Folk was sort of almost how little happened in terms of plot incident. You know, the dialogue was there. There was a lot of enjoyable. Um, things that felt very RTD, but I was surprised. I think it almost re reminded me back to that kind of classic Doctor Who structure of kind of how few yeah. kind of things can happen in an episode. And then I sort of, um, it wasn't a conscious decision not to continue it, but I obviously watched that first episode at a time when I was busy and just didn't get around to watching the second episode um, for quite some time. But when I then did, my experience with it was actually that I ended up watching episodes two to six all in one quick go and really really got into it then so it's this interesting kind of thing of being kind of not thrown or particularly surprised by the first episode but just having 
not necessarily had it resonate with me as much. And then suddenly when I actually sat down to watch the rest of it, kind of getting taken away with the pace of it. And I do think that does say something about the serialized structure of it. I do think watching it um, as serials rather than as individual episodes did work a lot better for me and kind of carries you along. And maybe that is to do with, you know, the difference between the serial structure and the sort of episodic structure we see more often in television today. That's a really interesting point. Uh, Every time I've seen the show, I've just watched it all in one go, like a three-hour joint. Mm -hmm. Uh, I've always just watched it as a singular thing because the episodes are are so short uh, comparatively and it, um, it... Although it's kind of two serials, it's also kind of all one thing as well. So I think, yeah, that classic who pacing point was really interesting. And I was surprised to hear you weren't initially super taken by it because I know you're a super fan like me. You've read the novelization. You've heard the audio book of the novelization. Uh, you're, you've gotten super engaged with it later on. So that's really interesting, Bryn. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, I, I pursued getting it originally just out of that RTD interest. You know, I've been trying to get copies of DVDs of stuff like you know the, the grand and revelation stuff as well for years and yeah yeah when i got the dark season one um and then i also got the i was able to get just a cheap copy of the book at the same sort of time so it was almost you know it wasn't a case of getting the series and then really enjoying it and then instantly getting the book it was a case of having got both you know out of interest and to look at it and then yeah as i say i've come around to really um enjoy the series i think it was just an initial perception of the first episode of kind of maybe even the fact that my expectations going in were um kind of similar to saying before about not expecting it to be as rtd flavored because of it being so early in his career so maybe when i went into the first episode wasn't completely blown away i was like ah okay so this is you know it was meeting an expectation i had that this wouldn't be the same as other stuff of rtds i'd looked at yeah bringing up (laughs) shows like the grand uh, you're speaking my language. I remember um, <laughs> scaring eBay for the novelizations of those, uh, which I eventually got. But my holy grail that I've not been able to get anywhere, although I know it exists in at least one form, is series two of Spring Hill, his bizarre, like supernatural kind of soap. Where I've got the yeah. DVDs of series one, but series two, it's and Revelation series two to a lesser extent. But Spring Hill series two, if anyone ever finds that, I would like nothing more than to watch that. <laughs> It sounds wild. Yeah, I mean, I'm aware that, that Series 1, I think, was only released on Region 1 DVD. Yeah. So I've, I've not even seen the first series, but I've read about it extensively. But Series 2, yeah, I, I'm aware of at least a, f- a couple of people who have got copies of it, presumably yeah. from private collections. Yeah. But- yeah, this lost media is so frustrating, I think, for RTD completionists like us. Yeah. But, I mean, one of the g- great things with uh, Dark Season is just... Um, you know, when I got it, it had been, you know, a hunt to see it on DVD um, for years. And then by the time I actually got round to watching it, um, it came round to be on um, BritBox yeah. in the UK, at least, very soon after. And also at a similar time or not long after um, Century Falls, which I think was probably even more obscure than Dark Season yeah. being available on BritBox as well. So I think that's a great thing that we're seeing with earlier Russell T Davies dramas. You know, we got it first with... Um, Queer as Folk and, and, and Bob and Rose, you know, dramas, I mean, but Bob and Rose, you know, easier to get on DVD, but not something that everyone would have seen necessarily. Yeah. And then for these even much earlier things, um, like Dark Season and Century Falls, I think it's great. And they do really fit well on that platform. You sort of get the sense that that platform's USP is kind of to have these um, kind of niche um, 80s, 90s dramas, a lot of science fiction on that. And so Dark Season, I think, fits really well into that kind of collection of science fiction that they have on Brickbox. I think you also get the impression that these days especially, RTD is bigging up his own back catalogue. He's pulling these things slightly out of obscurity and celebrating them um, again, which uh, I assume a big part of why we're doing this is because there's another series coming. Um, RTD's decided to go back to it and make more. That's the amazing thing. It's not just some tangential kind of spin-off from other writers. Russell T Davies himself, you know, over 30 years later, is going to be writing more Dark Season for that 2023 uh, four-episode second series on audio coming along. So, yeah, I love that the accessibility of his past work is rising up. Uh, and even besides the Brit Box, that the novelization of the book got that adaptation through uh, Big Finish, through Marcy's actress reading it out it's just it's good to see these things get accessible and it makes my 
it gets my goat even more with Spring Hill Series 2 and Revelation <laughs> Series 2 mm-hmm. for not being <laughs> accessible. Maybe one day, maybe one day. But, but yeah, I mean, that was definitely, it seemed like when Big Finish were launching that audiobook, I believe in some of their press around it, they said, they, they hinted at the fact that there may be something future to come. Yeah, It's also possibly, probably not the end of Dark Season because again, Big Finish wouldn't let something lie, would they? Hopefully a new season is coming. A new darkness is descending. New fights to be fought like a sequel and at the same time it said well we wanted to do this audiobook so that it was accessible in some format you know if people weren't aware of the previous story and obviously we're lucky that that's been coincided that Britbox has had the first series before um big finishes sequel to it but if that hadn't been the case the audiobook i think was very much intended as a stand-in for people who wouldn't be able to watch the original series um which i think was quite a clever way of, of doing it from big finish and almost kind of um soft launching this um continuation of the range. Oh, chilling stuff. Uh, more Dark Season next week, so don't forget, next time you get into a car, check behind your seat. Uh, Oliver, I didn't get around to hearing, what did you actually think of the show? Like, how did you like the show? What did you think of it? Yeah, so I had the same, initially I had the same struggle with the serialisation. The episodes aren't particularly episodic, um, especially that first one is sort of just events happening and then a cliffhanger. It doesn't have a great amount of story to it. Um, but I, I found the actual material of the show, especially Marty as a character, um, just really engaging. My first note I wrote down was, oh, neat. This is good, actually. Um, <laughs> which I, I wasn't expecting it to because of the, you know, not as big a fan of early RTD as I am of later RTD. And the uh, age range for the audience is... Um, something that that, that might have led it to be less interesting than I think it actually turned out to be. But overall, I really enjoyed it. After I got a couple of episodes in, I swam through the rest of it. I took a bit of a break between the two serials. Um, But I really liked it. I thought it was really impressive. Uh, It's not not incredibly deep. It's not got uh, an insane amount going on, but it's a really fun and really quite intelligent kids TV program. Yeah, I think it's lacking some of that RTD depth of characterization we love, but it's got a lot of good RTD things about tone and setting and kind of audience respect or audience engagement, the way he kind of pitches to the audience. It's got a lot of stuff we like from later RTD as well, I think. In the the characterization doesn't have the same sort of knotty moral contradictions that his uh his later more thoroughly sketched out characters have but all the characters still have that uh, third dimension to them that you're used to it's just in the context of um, a very different kind of tv show Uh, i i like how much marcy gets to be wrong um which reads counter to the point of that character it's really fun um yeah and obviously i'm sure we'll get on to there's a lot of doctor who in it yeah there is but i really like that I don't feel like the good of the show is just the proto Doctor Who-ness or even predominantly mm. the proto Doctor Who-ness where I know a lot of people approach if they're going through the back catalogue of a show or not. Like I know some people might watch Jekyll of Stephen Moffat's interested in the ways it's like a proto Sherlock or a proto Dracula or whatever more than the ways Jekyll is Jekyll. And Dark Season, I think if there was less that was interesting and enjoyable about it, it could just be read as, oh, look how Marcy kind of presages uh, the Doctor you know, as RTD would later write them. But I think that it's got its own kind of setting and tone to it that makes it something enjoyable to watch as a show, not just as like a artifact or as like a precursor to something, which is really good. Yeah, and it's definitely, there's a sense to which it's less comparable to what RTD went on to do with Doctor Who when he bought it back, you know, 14, 15 years later, as it is maybe closer to what would have happened if RTD was doing Doctor Who at the time. You know, yeah. because it, it really does feel of that time. You know, I think the serialization having it be, you know, three episode serials rather than four episode ones is definitely the direction that Doctor Who seemed to be moving a lot in the McCoy era. And it seems like there's an element of that in here. And I think just generally, the, it really does have that structure and feeling that invokes what Doctor Who would have been like in the, in the 90s. But I don't know how helpful it is in actually conceptualizing what RTD went on to do with Doctor Who at the time but it is nice to get that glimmer of what it might have been like if say Doctor Who didn't end in 1989 and continued on he was brought on you know as a writer to do a story or two stories or whatever you know that's always 
such an interesting what if the what if Moffat and RTD who were in TV at the time if the show had continued and they'd written for it I think about that a lot there's so many interesting possibilities and I guess RTD saw I mean he wrote Damaged Goods he wrote a Doctor Who novel in the 90s so there's there's kind of waves of that around but if we're talking about the 90s I want to kind of set out uh, the context of where the show came from because I think it's really interesting so I'll pu- I'll pull from a few sources here so Russell was working on a couple of different children's TV shows uh, before he started doing Dark Season. One of the big ones was a show called Why Don't You. Uh, do either of you know much about Why Don't You? Yeah, um, I am first learned about sort of RTD's work on it from his discussion of it on The Writer's Tale. You know, he talks about hmm. going from being kind of in a relatively minor role to it in, to then moving into almost writing full episodes of it just because of you know the, the, the nature of the show and the, the, the quick turnaround and it's also just something that um you know growing up in england i was sort of culturally aware of obviously it ended a long time before i was um born but um the sort of rather humorous um full version of the title which is the i can't remember the exact word now but why don't you switch off your television and go outside and do something more interesting instead you know my mum mm-hmm. who was a nanny at the time that this show was on for children, um, the age she was looking after, she would reference this show all the time in reference to just the title being slightly contrary um, promotion for it and wow. that role of it. So it was funny and interesting connection for me when I then learned that it was where Russell T Davies started a lot of his career in television. Yeah, My understanding of it is, so why don't you had like groups of kids and like viewers would like write in letters suggesting stuff for like the kids to do and the kids would go out and do them like they'd go out and do a craft thing or they'd go out and do some magic-y thing or some game thing and then that would be like the program i haven't seen any of it that's just my understanding from what i've read yeah my impression of for- format is that it's kind of the it's the magazine show format that's quite you know popular in britain it's probably the um comparison would be to something like um blue peter and again i don't know how much that translation does or doesn't hmm. translate internationally but um it's um w- w- if i think the idea behind it when it was originally launched was to do that but to have children hosting it with the logic being that children would rather watch people their own age you know or a bit older you know they're, they're kind of people they could relate to and have as their peers doing these um you know crafts or adventure activities or whatever it was more so than watching adults do those kind of things on blue peter yeah i interesting note with that too i think is we're seeing both RTD's TV career and I guess Moffat's career career since he was a teacher uh, before he was a television producer and television writer is this kind of engagement with children like this active writing for children or working with children uh, in the early of their careers so Dark Season being a children's show Press Gang being a show you know with children and aimed for children I think that's interesting how both their careers started from that seed I'm going to read some Davis quotes Russell T Davis quotes uh, that are relevant to his career Way back in these days, early 90s, uh, working on Why Don't You and shows like that. Uh, Russell was living in South Manchester at the time and he says, I'd sit in that little room in a basic bedsit in South Manchester in Fallowfield. I'd sit in that little room and think of Loch Ness and monsters and stuff like that. I can actually remember where I thought of things. It was a good place to live. It was so dull in there. All I could do was think, really. We did one episode of Why Don't You where they all went off to Loch Ness. A load of nonsense. It wasn't even Loch Ness. It was some lake. And they have an adventure and they potter about. And I remember being in the bath once and thinking, actually, if you did take all of the recipes and puzzles out of that, you could do a story about a gang of kids. Like things I used to watch when I was young. Two days later, in my head was Dark Season. So his original conception of Dark Season was like as a as a part of Why Don't You, like a spin-off of Why Don't You, using the Why Don't You kids. I think that's really interesting, that how, how it evolved from that. Yeah, I mean, I remember hearing the, um, the sort of working title for Dark Season, um, The Adventuresome Free, which definitely yeah. ties into that in that it's a much more children's TV sort of title than, than Dark Season, which is really, I find quite an interesting title choice, given that it is kind of so... Um, ambiguous and not you know it's not something that's ever specifically you know they never say oh and now the dark season's <laughs> upon us you know it's very much a kind of conceptual title that really gets at something interesting as opposed to the adventures and free which is a very broad um of a nose title that gives an impression of i think 
an altogether rather more sort of um, colourful and um, you know type of, of of show, and maybe even you know a slightly younger children's demographic. But yeah, it definitely feels like that title represents kind of the bridge between that initial idea and then the final formulation of what becomes Dark Season. They even dodge around the title a couple of times. There's there's a few moments where um, Eldritch says stuff like, "And now the dark." times are coming and it, 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 it like you say it feels like it's very particular tonally the the title of the dark season and i was reminded that um the the big finish box set is actually structured as seasons right each each of the four stories being yeah spring summer um autumn winter which which makes which contextualizes it differently and and makes something out of that title which i didn't really see in the show you're never too old to miss our smasher of a new season here on children's bbc all those shows coming very soon and loads more of your top jingles after another episode of dark season i also think it's really interesting that it was originally conceived as part of a magazine show because of how much of the the setting of the show is um, sort of in your school. Yeah. It's got that tone of this is what's happening underneath your school, in the shadows, in the corner of your eye, in the same way that Torchwood is, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. very much. Um, this is what's happening with your teachers and those kids who keep disappearing, and you just need to keep an eye out for the, the secret Nazis. <laughs> Yeah, the focus on school is actually really fascinating in that it also has a complete um, almost dismissal of home life as being something that's interesting, which mm. is such a yeah. contrast to what RTD would do later with Doctor Who companions who are, you know, even when they go off on adventures much further away than just for school down the road, they're still completely grounded in their home life and their families, you know, whereas here all we get is one glimpse of Marcy's mother at, at the start who... Marcy seems to be completely dismissive and um, in ch almost in charge of in a, a very kind of a scene that very well establishes that character as being both completely different to what most someone would be like, but also quite, um, I don't want to go so far as to say nasty, but there are definitely times where Marcy's um, forcefulness can come across as actually quite rude. You know, she's very rude to um, her friends um, once she accepts that they are friends and, and obviously to her, her teacher at times and that you get that whole dynamic but yeah it's, it's so interesting that Russell decides to completely not care about the home lives of these characters and to really focus in on the school environment where you know especially with the second serial the action does not really leave the school at all having a quick drive to the the hospital but even then marcy is completely centered in the school throughout it and yes obviously it helps that they've built an underground bunker under the school and <laughs> have plot about that but it's almost having the fact the um the enemy's lair so to speak you know the big third, third act bit be transferred to the school whereas in the first series we mm. have a separate building actually kind of even compounds that point further to say yeah this is really all about the school this is imagine that this is what's going on underneath your school you know <laughs> the the computer breaching up through the stage yes. in the assembly hall incredible that's that's exactly that tone it's something dark and hidden and literally eldritch um breaching through the ground coming up from underground into the most ordinary most regular schoolroom really cool what, that image it's like uh you know how david lynch sometimes talks about how to even talk about or try to dissect an image just ruins it because you're trying to make it smaller i feel like <laughs> that image of the nazi supercomputer crashing <laughs> up through the floor of a british school it, it feel like it says so much that even unpacking it just kind of diminishes it it's a beautiful image yeah it also looks great yeah <laughs> it's it, the rest of the show's a bit cheap <laughs> Um, but there's moments that look really stunning and that's a really great practical effect they pulled off there. And Marcy standing on top of it, brilliant. Yeah, I mean, Russell absolutely praised that set. Like, a, a lot of the interviews of Dark Season in, in the 90s and when he's talked about it in other places, one of the first things he often mentions is how, you know, this was the first, um, you know, proper, you know, drama he'd ever uh, written. And when he came into studio, you know, when he came and saw that set that they'd built with this, you know, moving supercomputer on a rostrum with these laser lights spinning off it. He was so impressed by the scale and so of doing it. I think it does 
stand out beyond anything in any of the other episodes of the serial. And I think it makes such a perfect, you know, because it, it a, it's a set piece when it comes up, but then it's also, you know, it's the environment that a lot of this big moral debate in episode six comes around. And yeah, it's it's the most important bit of set in the, the show. And I think that's why they obviously put so much effort into it and it really pays off. Speaking of effort, I want to pull back to how the show got developed. So back when he was still thinking of it as a why don't you spin-off, I suppose, uh, RTD wrote the first episode as a script and then he was clever and he was cheeky. He didn't just chuck it in the slush pile, the regular, you know, the way you regularly send in scripts to to the BBC because he was already working with the BBC, with the CBBC, the children's BBC. He used the internal posting system with a big, very kind cover letter from his current boss with Why Don't You to circumvent all that and get right to the head of Children's BBC and a home. I was lucky because I was working in the BBC. So I, instead of sending in an unknown script, I actually sent it in the BBC internal post to the head of Children's. And uh, my head of department, Ed Pugh, helped me do that. He sort of said, well, I'll put a covering letter in and send it off. To, so it skipped the slush pile, which is cheeky, really. But I um, went straight to the head of Children's and she commissioned it. It's like that was one of the best days of my career. Uh, so he cut past all the red tape there and he got right to the head of the CBBC who liked it but didn't like that it was a Why Don't You spinoff. And so it developed into what it became, which was original characters instead uh, and the title was changed to Dark Season and RTD says, that was really the proper start of my career. That was actually when I knew what I wanted to do. Interesting little bit of trivia there is uh, so when he when he wrote the second script later, uh, he'd shown the opening script to Granada Television, who also liked the script, but they wanted to do a six part show just based on our first serial, just based on the main Eldritch uh, computer serial, not the second Nazi uh, serial as well, because the show hadn't quite gone ahead with the CBBC yet. So there was already a bit of competition back there uh, between different networks. But of course, it eventually happened with the CBBC. Although ITD kept people in the dark about the actual unusual structure he was doing with the kind of two, three-part serials, which I, which I think is quite interesting. Yeah, and that um, it's interesting, that whole thing about... He does talk about how he gave the script to BBC and ITV at the same time and did sort of, you know, that came from his places. You know, he was not someone who'd ever learned how to be a script writer. He was not someone who had that previous experience. And so he did, you know, pretty much break break the rules in there and got in a bit of trouble. But of course, that then gave him the position where because both of them wanted it, he was able to, um, you know, make, make his choice and, and choose for what he preferred. And I think the fact that he chose, you know, BBC to make it children's BBC is an interesting one because, you know, at that time, you know, we could consider that maybe commercial television via TV might have had a bit of a bigger budget for it. But obviously, you know, creatively, that, as you've just said about wanting to do it, one whole longer serial might have been something that would turn him off. So, but it is interesting, given how his career has gone since and how he's um, re-advocated for the BBC, you know, in recent years, for him to make that decision, I do think is interesting when it comes to this um show and but yeah i'm sure also a lot of it is to do with wanting to have that structure which i think really works well i think especially because i think the second serial it's is, is by far the better one in a lot of ways um you know the, the first serial it comes down to it where marcy doesn't actually have an awful lot to do with the resolution which is you know an interesting idea in itself but really the plot is almost the science fiction element of the plot is almost solved off screen, um, yeah, and it's you know you get the clever twist about um, it being um, Mrs. Pozinski who's actually the professor and stuff like that. But it is a lot of adult characters talking and stuff, and, and then you know a woman in a completely different location um, pressing some buttons that solves a plot while Marcy and her friends are kind of left out of it, which I think is what elevates um, the second story which is that we get Marcy right at the centre of the plot resolution. Yeah. Uh, s- some other interesting RTD quotes on the genesis of the show. If th- if this one's really interesting. and ties into something earlier we were saying about the kind of lack of home life maybe or some other aspects of the show. He says, 
I wanted a fast, lively romp with no strings attached, no subtext. And then I do remember thinking I could do it as a four-parter and a two-parter, but that was impossible. By making two adventures, it gave the impression these children lived like this. You can guarantee that after episode six, they went off and had another adventure. And stand by, here comes another episode of Dark Season. And then about the kind of setting or premise of the show, he also says, In my head, I was very much in a sort of science fiction land. I walked around inventing all this stuff thinking, what if there was a secret laboratory underneath the school? And then so many years later, you get to actually write that. I love the, the, the classic, and I think, I think Oliver earlier mentioned a kind of Torchwoody connection, and I get that in kind of the, here's the mundane, regular, well, Welsh and Torchwood and English here, here's the regular mundane world, and here are the kind of hidden portals to the fantastical world, which I think Dark Season does in a huge way. Like we have the actual school itself in the second serial, and in the first serial it's kind of the invasion of computers as this fantastical thing. I really like how suburban the setting is like how we open on Bryn was talking about Marcy being a bit rude to her mum and we're just in such a regular British suburban setting there and how we have but next door is all this you know dark history and all these twists and all this crazy you know history with the programming and everything I really like the kind of juxtaposition with the mundane and fantastic I find it's very imagination stoking to me what do you what do you guys think of that element of the show what if the ordinary old couple in your neighborhood were secret computer engineers who yeah who built something amazing and, and have gone into hiding, right? It's uh, it, it's it's very children's fantasy um, just in the corner of your eye. It's the things that your imagination runs away with, um, which, makes, which makes Marcy such a great foil for the world of the show because um, uh, she's a, 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 a fantastical character but also a very cynical character yeah. um in that slightly offbeat Dirk Gently way very Dirk Gently um and and so so you've got this constant bumping of a world where anything is possible and there can be secret tombs and laboratories under your school um and also a lead character who's constantly shooting down fairly sensible sounding ideas because they don't make any sense in the context of this utterly uh, creative and sort of uh, children's imagination run loose world. Yeah, I think Marcy's an excellent protagonist for the show in that sense. It's, you know, this world where there's, as you say, the idea of a normal world, but there's these just things coming on in the corners. And Marcy's character, she's the one who's looking in those corners. You know, she she doesn't take anything as normal. If she sees a string, she pulls it, you know, there's that yogurt pot monologue in the first episode <laughs> yeah. which is um is, is you know it's fascinating is it just a sort of character a statement of what the character is but you know she sees this bit of litter on the edge of the road and she refuses to just think of that as normal but it's also great i think then the moment where as soon as she gets to school and notices the actual plot of the episode the computers when um her friends are still asking her what was going on with the yoga pot, she's completely dismissive of it, you know? <laughs> and I think that gives a really interesting image of a character as someone who's always kind of looking for this mystery kind of thing in order objects, but still in that episode, she knows when she suddenly found a real mystery. So the, the problems that she might, the things she might normally be focusing on, like yoga pots, which we imagine, you know, Ree and Thomas are having to put with, you know, every day normally gets forgotten about instantly in exchange for this actual science fiction thing in the in the tension with the only major teacher character you it frames all of that um marcy's thinking the way she sees the world the sort of holistic perspective that she's got um frames that as something inherently childlike um because all those conversations with the teacher are, you can't see this you won't believe us because we're children and you're an adult and you're just too old to understand the the fantastical things that exist just out of sight right you can't believe this thing um, because you're an adult and you won't believe us because we're children the the idea of of fantasy and hidden darkness is all framed like that which is really interesting for a kid show i love that neither marcy nor miss maitland are like i th i think they have the most depth of the characters in the show and they both have kind of good and bad qualities like we talked about earlier marcy's a bit too rude and too antagonistic a lot of the time. And Miss Maitland, 
also like she's too skeptical and she's too kind of condescending to the children in some ways but we also see the show is fairly kind to her it gives her a lot of lines about the plight of teachers which it's obviously sympathetic to and she's obviously tries to do the right thing in a lot of situations i really like that kind of dynamic because i feel like the show is letting both of them be wrong about some things and be right about some other things and just kind of having their differences exist i know miss maitland has you know lines about you won't understand this feeling of uselessness until you're older and then like you were saying oliver marcy has these lines about you know you believe everyone else besides a kid you know i, I feel sorry for you about that i'm sorry you couldn't believe us i, I really like their dynamic like that yeah miss maitland definitely feels like a character who goes on the biggest journey throughout the the series you know and you know because even after the end of the first serial she's still not willing to accept and believe them and yet it really does feel by the end of that second serial that if you um you know if they had have continued it over time or as they are continuing now that you have to kind of have her you know she she's witnessed everything in the second serial and been much more involved and i think you know she it gives her the best development in that sense that she's really someone who's come from that complete point of view of um, dismissiveness to now being kind of fully involved and aware you know there's the great bit of her and um, re breaking into the the dig site, and um, I love her moment in that where after they've gone and got the things, rather than exit out the same, she goes to kind of make a point to the person guarding it, saying, "Well, you're here to stop people getting in. We're getting <laughs> out." So, and I love that that attitude. And she's she does get great moments, especially in that second story. And you know, I love that she gets to, at the end, you know, in the final episode, she gets to basically just tell off a bunch of Nazis. And <laughs> I think that's a very Russell T. Davies thing to have written, the sort of middle-aged school teacher who yeah. tells off a bunch of Nazis and tells them how kind of rubbish and pointless and pathetic they are. Yeah. She says, you're no better than a bunch of Nazis. And they go, oh, <laughs> we've got some bad news for you. Yeah, I mean, that's, I find the handling of that whole thing so interesting because I'd always been aware of the fact that the villains were Nazis. I think I'd read the quote from, a quote from Russell about Jacqueline Pierce's character where he'd, you know, described her as being this um, lesbian Nazi supervillain kind of thing. And so I, I, got, I knew going in that they were Nazis, but I wasn't sure to what extent it would be acknowledged explicitly. And then when in episode five, you've got Thomas sort of suddenly realising what's going on and talking about um, the master race and, and realising that that's what they are, are are seeing in him and that's what they um, idolise with this whole idea of blood on hair and stuff. I was like, I wondered if they would be avoiding using the word Nazi and that reference to the master race would be as far as it goes. But then in episode six, when you have the teacher saying they're no better than Nazis and... Um, Mr. Eldritch just turns around and goes, they are Nazis in a very sort of <laughs> casual, dismissive way. I was like, oh, okay, yeah, we are just... I love that, yeah. A great delivery on that date. It's a perfect delivery, yeah. I bet there's nothing for children around now with lesbian Nazis in it. The beam of his mind, get back in there. It's not safe, Eldritch has betrayed us. Get back in there! There's a character played by Jacqueline Pierce. Uh, what's she called? Miss Pendragon. And, um, and indeed, and you've got to be careful on children's television, but um, she had a very Teutonic, gorgeous female helper. The Beamos has wired itself into the school. It was built to survive. It's very much hinted that she's a lesbian. Um, so even there, straight away, just can't help it. The gayness comes out. <laughs> I'm gay, by the way. But it's, I know. It's, it's a shock. And that gets you some... Uh, RTD is often not an incredibly neat writer, I find, when it comes to cleverly paying off like plot hints. But it gets you a really, really neat little revelation when you've been wondering why uh, we've had set up that the the behemoth needs a blonde, unbroken boy. Yeah. Um, and we find out that Behemoth's a supercomputer and we're still thinking, OK, well, the blonde thing made sense when it was mythic and magic, but it doesn't make sense if it's scientific. Uh, and then so after that, the reveal that that it's because they're Nazis and she wants someone Aryan to fill this role really neatly pays off both of those things. It's a secondary explanation to the magical, mystical version that we thought it was at the beginning. 
it, it turns out to be a computer and also Nazis, which together give the impression of a mystical um, uh, the, the ancient power. Yeah, that's another thing I preferred about the second serial was that kind of slipstream genre stuff with the fantastical yeah. kind of giving way to the sci-fi, but it kind of retains a bit of elements of them both. I really... It's not that I like that because it's Doctor Who-y. It's that I liked it when he did that in Doctor Who and Tortured as well. Because I love that kind of mix-up and melding of sci-fi and fantasy without kind of fully cancelling each other out. I thought that really gave some more depth uh, to the second serial. I really liked that element. And wonderful that the computer doesn't stop being fantastical when it's revealed to be a computer. It's still weird and fantasy. And it's very... That whole second arc is is very um, sort of... 90s internet sci-fi um basilisks and and thought experiments gone wrong and the scariest thing imaginable coming to light out of your own mind you know it's very interesting um we were we were saying it's interesting that there's how big mothers and home life are in rtd's doctor who and how there aren't many mothers in um in dark season uh, but there's some really strong parallels, obviously, with Miss Maitland and the mother figures in RTD's other work. Uh, the biggest one to me was the the moment where Miss Maitland is shown to have become a believer uh, and she's now fighting on their side is the moment she pulls up in a big industrial vehicle yes. to, to yes. break a thing, which is massively uh, Jackie Tyler- from Doctor Who. And, and I would say um, Years and Years and Children of Earth as well. Mm. There's elements of that in mm. there. Yeah. Yeah. And in terms of making the connection between her as a as a teacher and mother roles, I mean, it feels worth acknowledging that Russell T. Davies' mother was a teacher. Um, mm. I mean, and his, and his father as well. You know, both his parents were teachers. But I think just in terms of that idea of her, if her, she's similar to the other mother characters, it seems interesting that he writes that kind of maternal role in quite a similar way for um for a teacher character yeah and uh, of course that there, there, there's something very gendered and interesting about um about maternal characters turning up in massive heavy industry machinery and them taking a hold of something that neither of them own, neither of them are trained to use, neither of them belong in those machines. But in this moment of power, they're taking a big, heavy machine and using it to batter the bad guys around and get the good thing done. Um, it's interesting from a gender perspective. The, the, the type of thing we're doing right now <laughs> leads me to the thing I wanted to ask about, which is that earlier quote where RTD said, I wanted a fast, lively romp with no strings attached, no subtext. What do you two think of that? Sorry, mate. The subtext and everything. You can't, you can't get away from it. It's not happening. I think it's a thing that writers um, do when they're young, where they sometimes claim that there's not, you know, they want to say that there's no subtext in things. They want to say it's just about adventure. And even um, looking at um, Queer as Folk, some of the quotes that of things that RTD and other people involved, like the script editor Matt Jones said about Queer as Folk at the time it was coming out, contrast so heavily with what he says about it now retrospectively yeah that there's a feeling that the young russell wanted to be oh this is just a you know uh adventurous you know it's just a story about gay people there's nothing going on in it and then you know 20 years later when he's promoting it's a sin he talks about the hiv AIDS subtext in queer as folk and you know when i was talking about when i was writing about that and researching about that for my dissertation on that subject i went back and looked at what he was saying at the time and it was the opposite it was people saying oh you know there's no agenda there's no message it's not um you know we've excluded that but it's because we don't want to tell a story about that and it's so um fascinating to see that and i think it is just a tendency in these younger writers to think oh it's that it's in some way impressive to say you know it's it's just an adventure it's just a surface thing i think I think a subtext is unavoidable. I mean, that's a wider artistic discussion, but yeah, I think also it's a very, it does seem to be a thing in Russell's early career where he tries to claim, you know, that he's consciously avoiding that when the reality is um, that that's not the case. 
I love this kind of this this kind of subtext to writers talking about subjects. These kind of sub <laughs> narratives with how writers discuss their own work. I'm reminded of uh, in the in the Doctor Who magazine with the 14th Doctor's first comic. There's a column uh, where Russell T Davis is talking about how the Tenant and Tate specials came about, and so he's giving his you know bye 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 of how they evolved. And at, that column starts with him saying, "By the way, you know, <laughs> a lot of these anecdotes writers tell you about how things came to be." aren't very true and they're things that have kind of glommed together over time. So I think it's funny the kind of self-awareness he has over, you know, there's things I will say to you and, you know, maybe I will or won't believe him at the time, but there's always more layers to how we think. So it's it's funny to see his evolution from no subjects to the kind of, well, whether you say it or not, it's there. Yeah, it doesn't take long researching RTD to realise how many contradictions there are in yeah. things he says, sometimes weeks apart and sometimes, you know, <laughs> 20, 30 years apart, and those contradictions are just part of human memory as much as anything else, I think. Of course. Uh, as well as young writers liking to think that they're writing something that's all about the the characters and it's not thematic, it's not up itself, I think also practically, as a young writer, you don't want to come in swinging talking about, you know, your subtext and your themes, because that's not what production people are interested you want to make an entertaining tv show that that's the top priority it has to be the top priority and so of course you're going to say that that it's a it's a, it's a fun show about fun adventures um, yeah but subtext uh, especially with queer as folk um subtext and sort of the richness of the characters are one and the same in that the 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 subtext often is the things that the characters aren't saying, and you can't have rich characters uh, in the way that Queer as Folk does unless there are things the characters aren't saying. So, Yeah, and I think it's also interesting in that note how a lot of the um, the subtext of Dark Season that Russell's maybe denying exists, he himself makes text almost in the novelization of it, you know? Yes. The novelization yeah. of it gives a huge amount of background to a lot of characters in often quite you know dark ways i think there are definitely things in that book that you wouldn't expect to see in, that wouldn't feel appropriate in the television version regardless of um length and so i'm sure he had that subtext in mind when writing these characters for script and so by bringing it out into text with novelization you know i'm sure that influenced the way he wrote it when he was writing those characters in the script even though he didn't get to make those notes explicit. So the novel was published by BBC Books on the the day the first episode ended, the fourteenth of November, the Thursday in nineteen ninety one, and we'd get these like uh, little clips on the C BBC announcements that would advertise the episode, that would advertise the novelisation with the transmission of each episode. The novel of Dark Season by Russell T Davis has been published by BBC Books and is now available in bookshops. And as we like to say here in the cupboard, it's a gripper. It's a nail biter. And of course, it's a class drama only on Children's BBC. Another episode, don't miss it, of Dark Season this Friday afternoon. And in Russell's words about the novel, he said, You can make everything so much bigger. I think the novel ends with the entire school falling into its foundations. The writing is a bit lurid and melodramatic and shamelessly imitates Stephen King, but I'm still very fond of it. It's fascinating what the book adds to it if you kind of read the book and then go watch the TV serial because there's very there's almost nothing in the book that I directly contradicts um, the serial. I mean, there are a few kind of extended sequences and, and things, but generally speaking, it's more about, A, what happens in between the two serials, which I think is one of my favourite passages. Yes, yes. Um, but then also just about what characters are thinking at different times. There's a whole bit running through what on television is the second serial um, in the book about Marcy's kind of... Um, worrying that she's like lost a connection with her her sense of intuition but she's um not she can't quite rely on her reflexes as much as she did and she's she's struggling with that and actually if you read that and then go back and watch the tv serial it almost it fits remarkably well with what we're seeing on the screen even though there's obviously no point where she sits and goes oh i'm really struggling to make the normal intuitive leaps i do and I'm just trying to go along with things, it, but it, it fits really well. It reminded me so much in all the best ways of like Russell's Rose target Doctor Who novelization where it just enriches and adds so much. And it's kind of a different entity. While it links in perfectly well with the TV entity, it's kind of its own rich thing as well. I, I was, because it was a 1991 novel, you know, from Russell so early on, I wasn't expecting that much of it, but it, it really took me. So it really was a kind of, I think, 
like a transmedia thing of you could go buy the book as you're watching the show and you could read this extra Marcy material and then you're having your experience enriched and you know now you can do it with the audiobook that Marcy's actress read out for Big Finish. I think it's a really interesting uh, kind of side bit of material. I've got my copy in my hands because there were two bits I wanted to read a bit from which Bryn brought up which are the um the linking material between the two serials which I think is if someone's not going to read the whole novel it's worth reading a bit of those at least. So it's so it's like the novelization covers the first three serials and then it has this little extra section that kind of links the two of them together. And then it has a little coda section that kind of b- extends beyond the show and kind of sets up another third adventure we didn't get to see. I'm not going to read out the whole thing, but just an interesting bit of the linking material that happens after the first section. It talks about three months passed and in the first month there were protests about the useless computer systems lying idle in so many houses. But since the machines had not been paid for, the complaints had little impetus and it talks about rumors abounding and, you know, it, it kind of ties up loose ends with some of the different characters, it ties up loose ends to do with the school and the police and what happened to the headmaster and all kinds of stuff like that. It's, it's, it's really fun, little extra material. Uh, it, all, all the kind of loose ends are tied up in fun ways. And then it talks about, you know, the two scientists living next door a little bit. It says, at the end of the month, as the rumours were being dismissed as scaremongering, few people noticed an old couple leave their house in Dunstan Terrace to start a new life in Washington. No one had known them particularly well. It was said that only three children turned up to wave them from the street. So the story that they had gone to be acclaimed as foremost scientists in their field was greeted with derision. Christmas and the cold bite of winter arrived together. And then it starts talking about, you know, what ended up happening to Olivia. She was taken away from the school, put in a boarding school later. Quite a sad ending for her. Life made hell by those richer and more conceited than herself. Talks about how the spooky warehouse gets demolished. There's, you know, letters to the paper about the history of the town, that it used to be the old town's workhouse and it should have been preserved as a place of historical interest. However, when a further letter pointed out that the workhouse had been built on a burial site dating from the Great Plague, no one championed its cause. The ugly stone walls were torn down and the moors reclaimed a little land. At the end of the month, the town tip underwent one of its periodic refurbishments. Wide holes were dug for the rubbish and then packed with earth. The last computers disappeared from sight and memory. So all that's the tie-up material for the first serial, which is, you know, a bit of fun. And then what I really like is it links the two serials together in a way we don't get on TV. It talks about in the third month it snowed and how the school closed down and so kids were enjoying the extra holidays. But in the absence of the pupils, few people noticed a number of men on the frozen sports field apparently measuring the ground. They were finished in less than an hour and drove off again, so the incident went unremarked. At the same time, a rather grim little tale passed by unnoticed. A man called Osley, who was of course a Mr. Eldritch's misanthropic sidekick, a man called Osley took his own life in a prison cell. It only made a small paragraph in the national papers. By the end of the month, everything was normal. The snow had melted and spring seemed to be early this year. The school and the surrounding town lapsed into its familiar routine. At the beginning of the fourth month, Pendragon arrived. What do you two think of that linking material between the two serials? Yeah, I mean, when I was talking about it earlier, it was that bit with um, Osley that came to mind as being, you know, sort of darker than anything that happens in the TV um, version. And um, he gets a huge amount, you know, um, of backstory that's just integrated in throughout the drama of episodes one to three. And so, you know, it feels right, given that he's been given so much backstory, that he should get that resolution there. And it's certainly... It feels very Russell in terms of the way he's kind of fought to the logical end point of what he set up and decided that that's the ending for this character. But yeah, it was, I remember, you know, reading it and thinking that it was unexpected to see that in the book, um, given the sort of tone of the TV serial. Um, and so, yeah, that bit hugely kind of sticks out just for being remarkable in that sense. But it also, it's. Um, you know, it feels like a, a logical endpoint of a character given what's set up. I really adore the distance in that in that sort of whole interim section. The the stood back, you can almost see it happening in montage. Yeah, um, forgotten bits, things that were were not widely reported, and stuff that nobody quite noticed, and somebody might have remarked upon, but it never went anywhere. That that feels a piece with the whole mood of the show, um, the whole idea of where these 
terrifying things hide. And the, the show's very dark. We, we, we've we talked about the Nazis, but um, just in general, while being a fun and fantastical kids show, it's also really dark. Um, and so the, that that doesn't feel out of step, even though you couldn't have put some of that stuff in the TV show. It doesn't feel out of step at all for me. I love his kind of sense of form with novel. I remember uh, when the novelizations for Rose and for The Day of the Doctor came out together, I adore both of those novelizations. I adore them equally, but I adore them in very different ways. I feel like Moffat's 50th novel was like a... Obviously, he's read tons of novels in his lifetime, but it felt like a man kind of unfamiliar with the format of a novel. He was doing a, a crazy thing within the confine of like the shape of a novel. He was doing this bizarre experimental kind of take on, you know, what a book, what a novelization could be. It's it's so joyous and kind of shambolic in all the best ways. Whereas the Rose novel is like it's such a well-executed novel in its own right. Like the way he uses form, the kind of the, the, the prelude chapter you know which adds so much context and this own little standalone character story to the beginning of rose there's so much he does there where he kind of more i don't want to say conventionally but it's like he uses the format of a novel in really strong ways uh to accord with his own story and i felt like that in dark scene as well like the points where he kind of steps back with the perspective and he kinds of make it he makes it more epic in scope like in those interlinking sections i feel like he as a, he's a surprisingly strong handle on the format for you know, a writer early in his career in, in any format. It's 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 quite impressive, yeah. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right with that assessment and that the two target novel, the comparison to the two target novels that came out at the same time, Moffat's one and Davies one is interesting because I think Moffat is absolutely writing the Day of the Doctor novelization to an audience who has seen the Day of the Doctor on television. Yeah. You know, he's thought about the target format and he's thought what this format is in the 21st century in the 20, you know, 2018 when it came out, it's completely different to what it used to be. And so I should write a novel that is for people who've seen the show. Whereas the Rose novelization works perfectly. It works well for people who've seen the show. Obviously it has loads of extra details, but it still works as a novel that you could watch having never seen the episode. Hmm. And obviously the same is true of the dark season one, because that's, you know, coming at a very different time where, likely people would be even more likely to pick up the novel having never seen um the tv serials and i think it works it just works really well i think they're just they're com- both completely different beasts the show and the book and i think um yeah he just has such a s- strong um understanding of how to write the novel for that almost i feel i felt you know reading the novel listening to the audio back i almost felt like it felt sort of cleaner for the TV series. The TV series is really well done, but there are moments where it seems, you know, it, you can tell that it's his first show and it's his first, um, it, it, it doesn't feel as clean or as neat as some of his latest stuff, whereas for me, the, the novel feels kind of, you know, as clean or neat as a novel that he wrote in 2018 with the Rose novel, you know. Yeah. I want to um, I want to pull a bit from the uh, the, the ending. Like, it's, it, it's sort of a linking segment now considering we're going to get more of dark season in a form or another but so from the chapter 21 etc we again we get the three months past kind of format thing it talks about in the first week after the second serial in the first week the town went wild as the national press descended upon the school in the face of bland government excuses that an old coal mine had collapsed blame centered on the headmaster who had given permission for the dig so freely poor headmaster he gets a really (laughs) I mean, he kind of deserves it, but he gets a pretty bad lot in the novel. So the newspapers are printing the school that died of shame. Uh, But within two days, they changed to royal diet shock and the rest of the world forgot. There were no newsmen left to see the army excavating large pieces of machinery. Rumour ran riot within the confines of the town. But then private contractors moved in to prop up the building and fill the earth with fresh cement. The protests for an inquiry met with blank response as officialdom closed ranks and the event passed into local history. Then it goes on about, again... Uh, there's no school for a while, like with the snow after the first serial, uh, which I'm sure the kids very much enjoyed. Talks about a clothes shop on the high street closing overnight, its owner disappearing without a trace. Everyone assumes she just fled from debt and they didn't think any more of it. Moving into the second month, school started again. The children were divided into separate temporary sites. With the third and fifth years split up, uh, because that's, of course, our difference between Marcy and Reet and Thomas. Thomas, yeah. Thomas, right. So, what are their actual ages, by the way? So, Reet and Thomas are 
15? Um, so it would be, it's in the context of British secondary school. So what they're calling third year would be year nine and fifth year would be year 11. So a third year or year nine Marcy would be, uh, I think 13 or 14, depending on what point of year right. it is. And so Thomas and Reed would be 15 or 16. Yeah. Yeah. Depends. Yeah. 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 That works. That works. So the third and fifth year split up. Three children could be seen meeting regularly in a high street cafe. Often it was noted with disapproval during school hours. Tut, tut. Sometimes late in the afternoon, they were joined by a teacher and they annoyed other customers with their whispered conversations and laughter. How sweet is that? In the third week, a young actor called Luke Winsom was cast as somebody's long lost son in EastEnders and he appeared on the cover of Just 17. He was smiling, which gave him a double chin. At the- <laughs> I, liked, I liked poor little Luke. He had no idea what he was doing, uh, but he was pretty yeah. enough. That was his lot in life. <laughs> As the month ended, few people took notice of a story in the papers detailing a massive raid on an electronics firm in Southampton. At the same time, tarpaulins covered the front of the abandoned clothes shop as someone began conversions inside. In the third month, the headlines blazed with a story which no one thought particularly relevant to the town. The police raided the temple of an organisation called the London Caucus. There were many arrests. Apparently, a woman called Inga Hecker had turned Queen's evidence but then the story disappeared amidst mutterings of a conspiracy of silence. Two weeks later, the school reopened. Some people thought the contractors had finished the job with abnormal speed, but rumour failed to ignite once more. Everything quietened down as the summer exams approached. The month ended with the town settling into its familiar routine. A spectacular summer was expected. And then this ending of the book, I want to link a little bit to um what we know is coming next for the show or coming next for the do we call it a show when it's an audio? What's, what's coming next for Dark Season? So the book ends with, On the first day of the fourth month, the new building on the high street was unveiled. A neon sign named it Valhalla. It was an amusement arcade, a glittering hall of state-of-the-art electronic games. That morning, three children decided to skip school, dot, 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 dot. But that's another story. And so ends uh, Dark Season. And so that third story we never got. Uh, which is interesting to me because the show was actually a success. Uh, Victoria Lambert said back in the day that the BBC decided it had cost a lot of money, but it sounds like the actual reason was, the reason the show came about in the first place on the CBBC was because of a slot that had opened up because Maid Marion and her Merry Men uh, wasn't on for a couple of weeks. And so it went back into production and Dark Season kind of lost its spot. And so talking about what he would have done next, RTD says, I would have done an opening three-parter with a new villainess and that's blank in my mind, except that I fancied doing something in an amusement arcade with virtual reality machines. I would have bought back Eldridge for the second (laughs) three-parter. And and this doesn't accord with the actual sequel we're getting. Davies also commented that Miss Maitland would have... Well, actually, maybe it does accord. We haven't heard it yet. Davies also commented that Miss Maitland would have been killed off in a second season. Following the amusement arcade story, the second story of The Envisaged Season 2 would have involved two strange new twins arriving and climaxed with the school being sealed off for a psychic ceremony. As it transpired, this unused story idea would form the basis for dot, 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 a show RTD would do later. And then also uh, damaged goods references Marcy uh, as Colonel Marcy had a writing a report in the future relative to Dark Season. So it w- if there would have been a second season still in the 90s with this psychic story and also with this VR arcade story. That didn't come to pass, but we're getting a second season in 2023, which is set in presumably the 2020s. And astoundingly, has everyone coming back? Like, it's not just Marcy. It's Kate Winslet, of all Kate people. Kate And Thomas's actor, but also Eldridge's actor and Miss Maitland's actor. That's quite a coup. I, I'm very impressed with what Big Finish have managed there. Any, any thoughts on that second 90s season and also on the actual second season we are getting uh, next year? Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd read about the details of those um, serials um, that were, if they had have done a, a further two serials. And I know that there was, um, I think, um, T for Television, one of the Rusty Davis biographies suggests yes. that that idea of the amusement park story may have also had um, 
an influence on what eventually became the Sarah Jane Adventure story, um, Warrior of, Warriors of Kudlak, which is in, you know, a, uh, what do you call it, laser quest style um, yeah. um, thing. And that's that's an interesting comparison. So I wonder whether, it, obviously, I think Dark Season wouldn't have done aliens, but whether it would be a similar kind of thing of the idea that these were being used to train people for something in some way or, or to recruit or to find who was appropriate for something. It's fun to draw the tendrils out because this, the second serial, the psychic one, it goes in a Century Falls as well, the next show yeah. that RTD made. So he doesn't leave a good idea. I know in his announcement video for the Big Finish audiobook novelization for the first season, he talks about how Big Finish never leave you know a story without a sequel. But I think he never leaves a good idea unused as well, which is a great thing because he's full of good ideas. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, in terms of what Big Finish are doing now, like... Um when they first hinted that they were going to be doing a continuation, I don't know if I'd anticipated that it would be, you know, something contemporary to now rather than a sort of direct sequel picking up on the unmade stories. But I do think that's a much more interesting direction. And I think it means you can get the most out of your actors who are no longer um, teenagers. And um, yeah. being able to have those actors back is amazing. You know, the Kate Winslet news is amazing, but I think, in many ways, it's almost more impressive to have back um, Victoria Lambert and um, Ben Chandler, that's the actor who plays um, Thomas, um, yeah. because they, you know, you look at their IMDb pages and the only credit on it is Dark Season. Um, and, you know, I'm aware that Victoria Lambert is a, a drama teacher, head, head of drama. Head of drama, yeah. Yeah, yeah and I have no idea what um, Ben Chandler's been doing for 30 years, but um, it's great that not only... Could they find them to bring them back? But they were both, you know, willing. So yeah, I think it's really interesting that the the ideas for the second series seem to carry through um, so much of the, the the subtext that does, I'm afraid, exist about computers, especially yes. the the computers and um, and and legend and myth and how they all tie together. Um, very strong presence in the show that feels like the defining tone for me the defining idea is is this contrast between new technology new places hiding dark old secrets and yeah. ancient powers and it's interesting that the second series was going to carry through that idea the arcade feels like a really natural extension of that i i, I feel like the i think this ties into the wise decision to keep mr eldridge as kind of the over the over underpinning villain of the whole thing in series two, I guess, since he's in that as well. Because I feel like, to me, this kind of arcane, genre melding sense of computing, this kind of mystical sense of computing, this that lovely sense of, uh, you know, whenever Stephen Moffat talks about like number theory or like statistics, and it's mm-hmm. he clearly likes it, but he clearly doesn't really know what he's talking about. He just re- <laughs> yeah. thinks it's really cool. I, I like that RTD seems to have this sense of computing where he thinks it's kind of mystical and magical. I think that's really charming. And the, both series also have this idea of computers needing to link to humans. Uh, symbiosis and then the behemoth as well. I really like that. And VR would tie so well into that. And then I don't know about the second serial, the one that Century 4 has pulled from, but, you know, psychic links, you can you can tie, you know, matrixy connections into that as well. I really like that the show isn't just, you know, we have the Why Don't You gang, oh, now they're not the Why Don't You gang, off doing adventures and that's fun. It's It has an actual kind of underpinning idea here that's not just crazy computers it's like mystical computers and mystical computers that need to link to people. I like that. It it, it, it feels like an actual show. You know, there's like, mm-hmm. there's a couple of different ideas that underpin the whole thing. It feels quite fully formed, uh, which I really like. And I just love mystical computers. I think that's, that's awesome. Who doesn't like that? It's a really cool idea. Yeah. And of, of, of course, the technological, you know, idea of this arcade amusement park being named after this, you know, fantasy location of um, Valhalla is almost the exact same oh, beat as having, it, it's almost kind of, the behemoth being, you know, this fantastic described as this fantastical creature, and we actually get the um, supercomputer. It's almost doing that in reverse. You know, it's tying together the fantasy and the technological again in a really interesting way. I love also Eldritch has this thing about the the technology he uses is specifically technology that people develop, and then they're like, "This isn't a great idea," or you know, it's technology <laughs> that ends up not getting used. And he's like, "No, that's I, I don't make stuff, but I look at stuff that people made and then didn't use, and then I bring it roaring into the present day." I think. Uh, you could, that would work with VR in all sorts of cool ways. I, I really like that element of it too. The villain's kind of motivation with technology is interesting in its own right. It's very Curse of Femric. Yeah. 
um, that yeah, I I can see quite a strong influence there in the um, the the computing and mysticism and how um, uh, machines might hold dark ancient secrets. Uh, th- there's also something very sort of bureau punk about it. Um, the the bureaucracy and the the in between the the fact that um, Eldritch like you say, doesn't make things. He, he He's sort of a Moriarty figure who gets people in contact and provides them the materials they need. But also that whole interim section that, that you read from the novelization is about um, the, the the wheels of bureaucracy ignoring these the, these happenings, these phenomenons, and it all getting passed over. And the whole institution of the school is this big obfuscating... A system which doesn't look into the mysterious contractors or uh, the archaeological dig that doesn't make sense. And it's all about this sort of inscrutability that comes with those institutions, which, from the perspective of children, feels like this big dark cloud that you can't understand. Um, and th- that whole thing about bureaucracy is a very RTD tone, because um, something like... Uh, Children of Earth is entirely about um, the government bureaucracy and the people in between who make all the decisions. Um, so that I, I think that's an interesting through line. Go on, grab it. <laughs> oh, don't be mean. Just <laughs> oh, it's delicious. Hey, no, it's right. Mine. Time for another dark season now. There's a uh, there's an element of the kind of how we all conceive of the show. I want to dig into a bit. I think we've talked about it for over an hour, so now it feels appropriate to. Uh, the way we all approach the show, like including RTD, is pretty much to kind of approach it as Russell T. Davies' first show. Uh, you know, like specifically his first show as showrunner. And I think that's the tidiest way to talk about it and the easiest way to talk about it. And it makes the most sense to talk about it that way. Especially because like his work before, while important and everything, it's it's not just that it's harder to kind of make sense of because it wasn't shows that he created. It's also that it's harder to access. Like we talked about how Dark Season mercifully... It's easier to access these days than a lot of other things. But stuff like old, why don't new episodes or some episodes of Children's Ward or, you, you know, as, uh, parts of um, all these other shows you used to be doing are trickier to get hold of and trickier to kind of make sense of, you know, over 30 years later. So Dark Season, it's a show he wrote every episode of. Uh, it has these kind of proto elements of his other shows in it. We all kind of approach it as his first show as show uh, in that sense. That all makes sense. But... I think what's interesting about it, if we're talking about it more specifically in that way, is like we the the costumes of the kids are interesting, right? They're all in these kind of pastel. They're not wearing like school uniforms. They're in these kind of interesting pastel costumes. And then kind of bizarrely in the second serial, they're wearing the same thing as if they're like Simpsons characters. Like even though it's set months later, they're just wearing – it is kind of like a uniform even though it's their weird pastel clothes. That's not from RTD. That's he, he says, I have to say, I did not put those children in those costumes. I thought, ooh, why were they all wearing pastels? What was that all about? Uh, so what it is, is RTD was the head, the only writer. But, you know, when we say showrunner, it's a mixture of executive producer and head writer. Here, RTD, he did the scripts and that was, that was it. Like Bryn talked about earlier, how impressed he was by how they ended up realizing the behemoth. That was because he wasn't part of that. In his own words, I literally just handed it over the scripts in those days. And I remember not even knowing what sort of budget it would have. I remember about the time in those years, there were the cheapest science fiction dramas. I see what on earth? And they just take CSO stars and sparks as effects. I remember reading the scripts and thinking the behemoth in its chamber, that's going to be like a glittery panel against a studio wall. And then one of the best moments of my life, my whole career, was when I went and they were filming one of the behemoth things and I thought... Oh, it's probably just a space out the back. I turned up at lunchtime, the set was deserted, and I walked onto that set, which is still to this day one of the most impressive sets I've ever seen. That chair really lifts up with a 60-foot crane above it. He was he was the writer. He wrote everything, but he wasn't doing the rest of the stuff. If you read the writer's tale or you watch some of the behind-the-scenes things of his later shows, not just Doctor Who, but anything, he is <laughs> he's very much the producer. Uh, a very hands-on and active producer here. So I think it's interesting. I think we use the showrunner term as convenience, 
when we're talking about dark season. But there's a lot of British shows where the showrunner term doesn't apply so neatly. I mean, there's Doctor Who itself in its classic format. So I think it's interesting here to see we have RTD as a fully formed writer, but he doesn't have this kind of producing power or producing position that we'd have with his later shows. And so we get those little things that he had nothing to do with, whether he didn't like him, perhaps like maybe the pastel costumes or whether he did like him, like how they realized the behemoth. So I think that aspect is interesting. He's certainly the writer of the show, but you can see the difference in how he would be a showrunner with his later shows in the kind of quotes he was using there. Yeah, ab- absolutely. I mean, I think there's a lot of misuse or erroneous use of the term showrunner that goes around and often in a way that's quite you know ahistoric you know I think I don't think you can really call anyone in 20th century certainly not in in Britain writing a showrunner you know it is a very um a a new term to the industry and still you know even Doctor Who in its modern form having a showrunner was kind of ahead of the curve compared to um, British television and that is the way British television is going more now but um, yeah, it's certainly that lack of sort of producer creative control is something that's, um, you know, true. And it's tr- true that even before Russell becomes a sort of showrunner proper, as we'd understand it now, he does get to have more creative control, you know, in things like Queer as Folk. He was on set for Queer as Folk Series 1 almost all the time, despite not having that technical showrunner role yes there definitely is a middle ground there but yeah at dark season absolutely you know it, it makes sense that he would kind of be completely set before i do think that's worth acknowledging because as you say there are some decisions like the children not being in school uniform where it is kind of hard to see where that's where that comes from um given that it's not really at all kind of naturalistic to anything that we would have in in you know, British society does seem like an odd decision to make, um, but it's harder to comment on because we can't comment on it from our understanding knowledge of a writer like Russell T Davies because it's out of his hands and obviously we don't know anything or don't know as much about the director and producer and costume designers of this series. I mean, I guess it comes from a sense of wanting the characters to have an identity that isn't just, you know, school children that is less generic, but beyond that, it is hard to kind of justify. Yeah. It's interesting that it was written with no um, real sense of what the budget was going to be, um, because the, the whole tone of um, a show being set in the ordinary world with horrible things in uh, just out of sight is a very budget-friendly uh, type of TV show. Um if you're doing vast fantasy, it's it's very budget friendly to do that in a in a way that conceals it with a lot of the real world and a lot of real locations you can use. Um, so I think it's interesting that Russell wrote stuff like um, the Behemoth breaking up through the the assembly hall floor um, without knowing what kind of budget they were going to have and not making those budgetary decisions that he would go on to make all the time on later shows. He found the experience of making the show, even just as a writer, not a producer, really affirming. He said, I'm not kidding. Uh, Everything made sense, you know, after making the show. I just sat there and went, that's what I want to do. I got the greatest kick out of it. It felt absolutely right. At the time, I was mainly producing and directing. He's thinking of shows like Play School there. Uh, but seeing that credit made my mind up, you know, Russell T. Davis on the screen. I decided, actually, that's what I've got to pursue in life. And of course, this this is the show that put the T in Russell T. Davis to to differentiate himself from hmm. uh, another Russell Davis. <laughs> and so, so he kind of improvised that on the spot when the director of Dark Season was asking him, what should we put in the opening titles to- are there so yeah it's a great it adds an air of authority doesn't it but russell t davies rather than just um and i mean i mean even now the fact that it is just a made-up letter is a great thing (laughs) to learn and um the recent um series of um staged with david tennant and michael sheen referred to is about actually its first episode spends um an amount of time making a joke about what the T actually stands for, which was particularly amusing to hear Russell T Davies being acknowledged that way in a, a popular show and, and talked about. Um, he he quips quite a lot, Russell the Davis, which, yeah. like you say, air of authority. It was now that I added the T to my name to distinguish me from another broadcaster called Russell Davis. 
uh, uh, slightly odd thing that I, I wanted to get in earlier, um, but um, sort of missed a slot too. Um, Osley, the henchman guy, uh, it, do, is, do you have any idea if he's named for Oswald Mosley? Hmm. Because Osley is a name, but it's a very rare name. And Oswald Mosley is a, you know, very prominent figure in British fascism, which obviously ties a lot of the series together. If you Google the name Osley, the first result is Oswald Mosley, which I thought was interesting. Um, There's a lot about fascism in the show, which is interesting, um, given it wasn't, you know, supposed to have subtext. subtext, But... um, well, I, I guess a lot of the stuff about fascism isn't subtext. It's just it, yeah, that's we were applauding earlier. Yeah, the the openness with some of it. That's interesting about Ozzy. I hadn't thought of that. Uh, maybe I love I love his kind of section where he kind of justifies his himself, his kind of misanthropy as it ties into Eldritch's schemes. I think he was a quite interesting little henchman character. Yeah, and there's a there's a great sort of interesting tension between the sort of um, fascism tones that are brought out in the script and then the kind of almost contradiction of that with Eldritch who's got this obsession with um with chaos yeah. and um you know Eldritch motivations are very kind of nebulous like you know chaos it's a great um <laughs> word and you get some great speeches out of it but what he wants or why he wants it you know I mean it plays into the ambiguity of the character absolutely but then it does create this interesting tension between that and the fascist um forces at play within the narrative and um, it's it's interesting because that point you've made about Oswald Mosley is not something that has occurred to me at all. And now that you've said it, I kind of can't help but think was that intentional. But at the same time, obviously in that um, first serial, um, Osley's um, decision in the end is kind of actually to embrace um, chaos with Mr. Eldridge when he's um, the scientist character is trying to kind of convince him and bring him around. And I do think that is... Um, one of his better moments in the TV series. I think it's a character that works a lot better in the books for me because too much of it in the TV serial is just him being to Mr. Eldritch, like, oh, I'm not sure about this, or I'm a bit nervous, <laughs> just going and doing it anyway. And it <laughs> grates a little bit, but um, there's a lot more depth given to that in um, the book version. And I do think even on the TV version, his kind of final moment of going, actually, no, I am fully you know, on the side of the chaos and the the darkness um is a great a great moment i i yeah that's a very rtd beat uh, um a character who you think might have substance to redeem them turns out not to um that's that's lovely uh, there's a lot of uh, rtd writes about names a lot um it's always a thing uh, in his writing either someone's name means something it's it's mercy or kindness or something or the fact that you do or don't know somebody's name ends up being very important uh, and and they're not they're not subtle in dark season pendragon is the name of the the british british fascist who yeah um who who, who believes in the the superiority of um this sort of anglo arianism on pendragon I think it's interesting, two things. One is that Jacqueline Pierce is, you know, a kind of titan of genre TV like this. Uh, but she she was a recast. Uh, one week out, the original actress for the part got sick. And so, Jacqueline, Jacqueline Pierce was a late recast into it, which I think is interesting because she's such an iconic part. You know, she's you, one of the faces you put on the DVDs. That's interesting to me. But her character itself, uh, Bryn mentioned this earlier, this uh, Russell T quote, which is, the first gay character I ever wrote was a devil-worshipping Nazi lesbian in a children's BBC thriller, Dark Season. She was too busy taking over the world to do anything particularly lesbian, though she did keep a Teutonic Valkyrie by her side at all times, like you do. Still, it was a start, and at ten past five on BBC One, that's not bad. Excellent. The whole blonde thing with the Nazis, uh, Jacqueline Pierce refused to dye her hair. That's why we get the turban <laughs> instead. Mm. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's a lot of extras in slightly dodgy blonde wigs um, as well, which is... Ah. Also, with with the Nazis, with Pendragon and the Nazis, one of the few deleted scenes of the show was that originally 
uh, in the final episode in the hall, Pendragon was supposed to say, there's a noise calling me and Inga, her lesbian sidekick, would reply, it's the sound of death, the only sound you ever bought us. And the fact that they got rid of that kind of resolution of Inga and the sidekicks, although, of course, the novel goes into it, meant that in the actual TV episodes, the rest of the Nazi followers just kind of go away uh, at a certain point in the sixth episode. Yeah. It does. There's a big feeling of sort of Mr. Eldridge turns up and suddenly, uh, you know, everyone else isn't as important anymore, you know, so the, the Nazi characters are kind of put to one side and, you know. It's uh, it's interesting you, you bring that up, the kind of um, kind of messiness of some of the writing because an interesting thing for that. So a, a Russell quote about the second serial is, I was writing the second adventure in such a panic, not knowing what was happening, and the end of episode five didn't work, which is how the idea of bringing back Eldritch came about. But then also... Uh, in The Rider's Tale, in Russell's great book, The Rider's Tale, he's talking to Benjamin Cook about would he have liked longer to write a certain Doctor Who episode. And he says, Well, I've always written fast. The second drama script I ever wrote, Dark Season Episode 2, comma, 1, com- completed in two days flat, which makes it sound like a piece of piss. But I hope this correspondence is making it clear that it's the thinking beforehand, not the typing, that takes up my time. You're right, though. Give me more time and I'd waste it, not consciously, but just because the adrenaline isn't there. In the old days, I had so little faith and so much fear. I used to write out the entire episode in longhand first on one sheet of A4. Well, it was tiny hand, not longhand. I can write very small microscopic writing. It's a handy skill in wartime. I loved those pages, but they were a crutch. As the years went by, they became just scribbled headlines, then a few words and maybe a drawing until slowly over about 10 years, I abandoned the paper and wrote straight onto the screen. I can't remember that transition actually happening. There was no great paperless ceremony because it just evolved. But today, the notion of writing a line, pausing, taking a walk in mystic contemplation feels alien to me. Once I'm into a script, I hurl myself into it and stay there. The quiet days in the middle are more tiredness than anything. The fear of screwing it up wastes time too. Uh, so that's one of the, that's a, a scant mention of Dark Season in the writer's tale, but it's interesting to see. It does feel like a show written quickly. Um, it is then sort of interesting out of that, but again, I think what we've kind of, at least between us, agreed is maybe the stronger serial comes out of that difficulty. Yeah. And yes, mm-hmm. there are problems in it, but also the kind of ideas in it and the frenetic energy and having Marcy be the um, one sort of pushing revolution. You, you know, it centres our um, lead characters more than the guest characters um because there's no sort of heroic guest characters all the guest characters are the villains um but yeah it's interesting to think that came out of what was more of a struggle maybe that even does sort of tie into what russell himself is saying about you know working well on that sort of quick pace and um under pressure yeah and i do think you really get the sense that the ideas especially in that second series have gestated Uh, yeah that they've sat underground for a while, building up power. Underground, yeah, very good. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> they, they, well, it feels like an evolution of the first serial in a lot of good ways. Yeah, it, it does feel like it's just tainted. Good drama, that gripping stuff, eh, rats? Yeah, but what happens next, Toby? All right, all right, calm down. You can see the last episode of Dark Season tomorrow at ten past five. I think something else that I love about the show is we've talked about how fully formed it feels in some senses. I think the tone of it is something... If you're watching it now on BritBox, you know, in parody with shows that came later and, of course, actual modern shows, this might come across as less remarkable. Uh, But it's pretty novel that something like this was coming out on the CBBC back in the day. There, I've seen people talk about the show as it aired and talk about there weren't really, there wasn't much like this. It's getting scarier and scarier and it's back next week, even more scary. Now, Dramas on CBBC up until that point were all very, very sort of bodger and badger was considered, you know, like an entertainment drama. And they were also kind of very slapstick, the Chuckle Brothers. And we hadn't really had proper gritty drama, certainly nothing homegrown. How do you do? How do you do? Where's Mark? Kate Winslet, for instance. I mean, Kate Winslet was in a children's BBC drama. Robert Coles was going on about her the other day. Which Robert Coles? Robert Coles with no chin or Robert Coles with nasty shoes? I genuinely liked Dark Season. I like drama. And I, I, but back then, you know, fantastic. And I don't think they even do drama that well now. Like we've said, it's actually a surprisingly dark show and it takes itself very seriously, not just in the writing, but fortunately the director was kind of synced up 
with what RTD was doing and he made it in a very serious manner itself. You know, the show is on location so much so it feels very kind of authentic and legitimate. I had a head full of scripts every night I was writing and the dramas were getting darker. I can see nothing wrong with children having nightmares, good, healthy nightmares. Well, in terms of tone, uh, the director, Colin Kant, who did all the episodes, had said, fantasy is back in vogue, talking of the early 90s. I think it's a rebellion against all the realism that we have on TV at the moment. Things like Grange Hill. Young people want a bit more excitement and heroism in their lives. The chance to imagine what it would be like to be face to face with danger. To be in a situation where they're fighting for their lives. It's all escapism, of course, but it does have a hard edge. It's all escapism, kind of the, there's no subtext, Russell kind of thing. But this hard edge, you can see he's kind of really linked into, this isn't pitching down to kids. This is kind of a gritty drama in itself. Good, healthy nightmares, in his words. He's written kind of a sci-fi thriller for kids, but perfectly kind of, I think adult's the wrong word, because I don't want to equivocate adult with like being good or adult with being mature. It's for kids, but it's a proper goody drama for kids. And that's part of what I love about RTD is that he doesn't write down to kids. He writes great stuff and kids, you know, it's for them without being childish. It's for children without being childish, I guess you could say, uh, which I absolutely love. And I think that's what Moffat did with Press Gang as well. And I think that's just such a great mode of writing for kids without writing down to kids. I really love that. Definitely helps with Doctor Who. That that kind of respect... But both uh, Dark Season has a really strong sense of respect for the kids, um, yeah. which is really cool, I think. Um, and you can see why kids love it, right? It's the Sarah Jane Ventures as well. Um, while there's a there's an adult figurehead, the, the kids are treated as intelligent and active characters with strong personalities who make decisions. And that's what kids like to see in TV shows. It's great. This is great stuff to feed kids on. I think what's really interesting is that there is that there's that seriousness, that maturity, that drama. It does some very real, sort of fantastical drama stuff, and yet there's also this um, very Russell kind of sense of humour, just in the kind of dialogue and quippiness that doesn't negate the seriousness of the situations. But you do get that sense of humour coming through, and it's kind of funny to think of that in 1991, where sort of anyone kind of doing that in the 21st century it kind of gets labelled as um, Whedon-esque because of the whole <laughs> the Vampire Slayer thing of its sense of humour and, and quipping in these serious situations. And obviously that term of describe, comparing everything to Joss Whedon has its own issues given um, some of the things that have come out about the behind the scenes of his work. But it's interesting to think that, yeah, Dark Season really it has that exact same thing, I think, of kind of having these serious, dramatic situations. But people in them are kind of quipping and making jokes and yeah it's kind of funny to think that when that comes up in Doctor Who or Torchwood people might describe it as weird because that comes after and yet Dark Season it feels like very much has that beforehand and um, another sort of point of the sense of humour is um, there's it's a, a, a kind of a performance note almost where I think generally the performances here are quite good there are moments um, even you know no um I, I sound like I'm about to be insulting Kate Winslet's acting, which is probably um, <laughs> not good when she's the Oscar winner. But um, there are moments where I don't know if the child actors understand the joke they're saying from the delivery. And again, that might come down to another point of Russell being completely hands-off in production. You know, he wrote it and then it was sent in, but he doesn't quite have that control to check on these things. But there's sometimes the way that the young actors punctuate lines that are meant to be humorous as they say them i don't always know if they get if they if they themselves understood the humorous intention of it but that's like a, a really small thing there's plenty of jokes that do land and are performed brilliantly you know, i think i think kate winslet does the where am i going to go ipswich line perfectly i think that one's you know um exquisite <laughs> and um, yeah and interesting in terms of talking about um earlier you were saying about the direction being kind of um, in tune with Russell's idea of dark. And I do um, think that, you know, the locations and the kind of, um, even some of the lighting choices, especially in the first serial, you know, it does kind of add to that and it feels um, the drama tone. However, I do um, take the 
amount of canted angles at some points. <laughs> Especially during the first series, it's there a bit at times for the second series, but you really notice it during the first series where every shot it cuts to is a canted angle, but always at a different way. It's, oh, it's, it's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, I think on the whole it comes across brilliant, but you can always pick up those, those criticisms. And again, it's hard for me to compare to other things at the time. I don't know if that's just something that dates it. I mean, at times not quite to the same extent but you know there are episodes of modern doctor who have got this issue of doing too many canted angles as well you know human nature and stuff like that it goes a bit overboard and but this is another level of just you <laughs> almost disorientatingly turning the camera um on onto an angle all the time there's there's a number of rotating um shots right that start level and then uh, as the scene it gets more, you know, frightening. Uh, rotates to a to an angle, right? I, I I noticed that as a directorial thing. I thought that was neat. Yeah, yeah. I think there's, that's it. There's definitely bits. You know, I would be perfectly happy to have. You know, say Mister Eldritch's entrance, like his return in the second yeah. serial, have like a kind of angle. There's, there's great bits where they can use it and where I think it looks good. And that's it. The framing of those shots is still good. Like I'm not going to suggest that it's. Um, poor direction because those shots still look nice they're well composed well framed but there's just an abundance of and I think you notice it most in maybe episodes two and three maybe um, where it's just like you'll cut from one shot that's at a canted angle one way to another shot that's at a canted angle the opposite way and that really yeah. causes you to notice it I think much more and yeah and also I, I think it's a 90s early 2000s um, yeah. visual technique that hasn't aged particularly well just because of overuse more than anything um it's a it's a very quick well not massively quick but it, it's a fairly easy way of getting a visual identity um with some pretty basic techniques and so of course in tv especially people used it a bit as soon as they started to be able to because i i guess in the 90s this is um, like you were saying, kids' drama um, and TV drama is sort of coming into its own new age at this point. I think Bryn also made an important point in this precedes Buffy by quite a bit. And I think this really adds to the interesting stew where we talk about, you know, 2005 Doctor Who and then Torchwood, you know, pulling so much from Buffy and Angel. But also, like, we've talked about links with Torchwood and Dark Season. And it's like, it's never as simple as just this kind of ancestry talk of this show led to that show, which led to this show, which led to that show. We can see there's so much in Dark Season already, which, you know, the, I, I, lo I love that point you made, Bryn, that, you know, we're going to we call, you know, aspects of Torchwood, um, you know, like Joss-esque, but, it, well, they're pulling from stuff that RTD did himself. Of course, this show is a stew of other influences, but it's like we can't all be experts in everything forever. But it's interesting to see this kind of web of, Dave is coming up with his own ideas at some points or he's pulling from stuff that we've kind of lost because we've not, you know, people remember Buffy. We might not remember what Dark Season is pulling from so much. I think that's all really interesting uh, observations. And in terms of the direction again, you know, I think um, there's a sense of pace it does have. I think certainly as the series develops, again, I've sort of talked briefly at the start about finding the first episode a little bit slow, but I think as it goes on, there is a sense of pace which is there in the edit and the direction. I think that's another great example of the director kind of picking up on how Russell's written it and running with that. And it does feel, you know, I've seen so many kind of productions, especially often productions early in a writer's career, where the director seems so out of tune with what the writer is doing. And that doesn't seem to be the case here. You know, we've mentioned small production design issues that Russell might not have had been a huge fan of, like the clothing and stuff. But on the whole, it's really, um, really well captured. The director, I think, the sense of pace that Russell writes with you know there's writers and um, there's a lot of producers directors who worked with russell talk about you know you get a script from russell and there'll be twice as many scenes as um a script um from someone else of the same length um just because of the way he writes and while that's not necessarily a style that he's found here yet in the actual writing of you know literally scenes there's still you know there's often cut and forth between two plots i think especially in the second serial that works well when you separate the main group of friends for so much of it and um yeah it kind of adds to that sense of pace which the director really puts up on it and, and and yeah i think there's already a sense of russell is writing 
quite a lot of scenes. He's not writing kind of slow, stagey scenes and then cut. You know, he will um, cut about and play with, fast and loose with it. Good stuff. OK, rats, curl up and settle back at home. It's the last part of our drama, Dark Season. There's, uh, when we were talking earlier about the way the show works for children, as well as the stuff uh, Bryn was talking about with the child acting, I want to think about Marcy a bit more. So Marcy gets a lot of very memorable sequences of dialogue to go through, like normal is for the comatose. If I'm to teach you to anything, it's this. Wherever you are, whoever you are, there's always a strangeness in things. You just have to know where to look. And patterns don't make sense close up, but just a jumble of lines. You have to step back. Uh, Even in the second serial, you were built by sad, stupid people, but that doesn't make you a sad and stupid machine. You can be better than us. I think the easiest way to talk about this is to talk about these are like doctory speeches and these are like Doctor Who speeches. But I think while that's true, what they are is like good, characterful, kind of inspiring, weird dialogue, which isn't... uh, Doctor Who doesn't own that. <laughs> you know, like I, I, I think we kind of backwards project like stuff as Doctor Who just because it's an easy way to talk about this. But I think just on its own terms, this is just good character writing for a wacky but kind of headstrong but also kind of knows what's going on even if she's naive in some social ways kind of character. I think that's all really good. And you can pull back to like, well, if it suits any Doctor, it suits the, well, I guess the incumbent Sylvester McCoy, seventh Doctor, the kind of way she talks about this kind of hierarchical, she's teaching her companions in Reet and Thomas things. Uh, if I'm to teach you to anything, it's this is like a common refrain she has throughout the episodes. Uh, but I think it, like it's good. It is good Doctor Who dialogue, and it's also just good dialogue in general. I have a question on this. Um, does the novelization or any, I suppose, um, extra texts uh, go into, uh, I guess, backstory for Marcy? Um, because the the show itself plays, it acknowledges that um, that she's an interesting person who thinks in a specific way, but it, it refrains from actually giving a reason for that, which I really liked. I think it's really interesting that she's uh, a clever student at a school, and and that's all we need to know. Uh, but I wondered if there was any extra material on that. Yeah, not not hugely is the interesting thing because it does do you know more backstories for other characters like um, Pendragon and um, Osley, um, but um, then avoids it um, more for her. I think what I do find is interesting is um, it really focuses on where she gets her knowledge from at places. You know, it explains it, there's. Um, it explains about her kind of reference points being more like TV and film and media. There's references, I think, to her reading 2000 AD and getting things from that. So the idea that when she kind of says these things that shock the adult characters by their kind of accuracy, that she's not actually pulling it from, you know, she's not learnt it scientifically or academically. You know, it says she's actually very bad at physics and chemistry, and yet she's able to pull out, because in part because of her intuition, the right phrase, like an electromagnetic pulse in the start of episode two to kind of make the scientist character think, how does she know that? When in reality, it's, and, and, and it's that clever thing of having the right words to say at the right time. But yeah, it, it, it really does kind of draw attention to the idea that she's very much not getting that from a sort of academic knowledge. Yeah. that That's really neat that um, th- this really brilliant lead character, an aspirational character, I think, in in a way, um, of a kids' TV show has built up this knowledge largely through TV. I think that's great fun. I was going to say, when it's when it's listing the kind of reference points that she's pulled something, that she's pulled stuff from in terms of media and culture, and it talks about 2000 AD, so you, you, know, you almost feel like it's only, you know, half an inch away from actually saying Doctor Who, and it, yeah, it, it doesn't. Yeah. And in that moment when you're reading it, you're kind of like, is it going to go there? But no, it, it, it doesn't, but you wonder whether that's a conscious omission, you know? I think a really wonderful dimension to Marcy's character in comparison to Doctor Who um, is the what you were talking about with hierarchy, um, yeah. where she doesn't naturally have any. She's the, by most metrics, the least powerful person in any given scenario. Um, she's, she's a kid and a young kid at that. 
um, in a school. She has no power whatsoever, which makes her brilliance that much more interesting. Um, the the fact that she can talk around a supercomputer or um, uh, uh, convince the people who need convincing at a moment of great importance, I think that makes her really engaging. It's, I suppose, and again, the fact that we um, tie this all to Doctor Who is... Uh, uh, symptomatic of s- something that has gone wrong in our brains, but um, <laughs> the the I'm reminded of um, Inside Man from recently, which oh, there puppets, were a yeah. couple of great podcasts on. Um, uh, the the way that um, uh, uh, Dolly Wells' basement lady, what's her name? Um, it's not Agatha. <laughs> No, but, you know, but but that's the same thing of a character who is, by any metric, the least powerful person in that scenario, um, using their own brilliance and the, the pure power of, of, of their character, their own agency, to leverage some influence that, by all rights, they shouldn't have. I think that's a really engaging type of character um, uh, because of that, that, that inverted hierarchy of power. Yeah, and I think it's what makes Marcy and Thomas and Reed's dynamic um, so interesting. That you know, the typical way of playing that, the way it would appear from the surface, is sort of two older characters, fifth years, who've kind of took pity on this um, younger character mm-hmm. who's kind of a loner, and it absolutely doesn't play out like that. You know, it's almost yeah. it's very clear in the books that she's drawn them into her a little bit, and they're kind of hanging on her every word, and she, you know, she's in charge. She built a group of companions. That's yeah. We, you've kind of mentioned the TV self-awareness of her and there's like the yo-yo is an actual reference to the arc in space from Doctor Who and the marvellous from a cliche line when she's escaping through a ventilation shaft. I mean, that's not just Doctor Who. That's all sorts of genre shows use that kind of trope. But there is this kind of self-awareness to her. Uh, Russell says, I was steeped in Doctor Who. I just wanted to get rid of all the padding and make Marcy very aware that she was in a sci-fi drama. So she had an omniscience, which then made her Doctor-ish. And I, I, can't, I kind of love that the show doesn't feel the need to explain. Like, Eldritch is bad because he's a, the bad guy. Like, there's not really a sense of... it. Kind of, there's kind of an assumption of genre savviness, which I think is really good. I think kids and people in general feel more invited into things when they're kind of fully formed like that, rather than if they're feeling the need to explain everything necessarily. But also on that TV self-awareness point there's little moments like uh, when olivia the girl who gets like possessed by the symbiosis computers when she comes back into the classroom and she's got that crazy bright glow uh our blonde thomas says it looks like she or sounds like she hit the ready break too hard and the ready break that's a bit lost to us now but he's referencing um the way it an advert for ready break looked back in the you know the early 90s there and so i think that's one of the um the things we see a lot from RTDs, this kind of characters are imbuing a sense of pop culture awareness because it's like the characters are living through the pop culture we're living through. You, this was very, very clear in his Doctor Who, at least his first Doctor Who run, uh, but it's in his other shows as well. And I think it it's this kind of very similitude of Davis, it, he, he engages with pop culture so much. He has his finger on the pulse of pop culture so much and then his characters kind of feel very real and authentic in the way interfacing with that as well and i just like this kind of sense that for you know more or less a first tv show of his own creation he's already got all this kind of genre savviness and kind of placing his own show in the tv landscape i think it's a really one of the really fully formed bits of his later career uh present in this show and i think it really adds an interesting element to the show i agree <laughs> <laughs> it's weird that this is just school reunion right yeah <laughs> That's yeah. weird. It's I weird. Mean, all the stuff with computers in the first um, serial in particular really puts me in mind of both um, School Reunion and also, weirdly, um, Downtime, the Doctor Who mm. spin-off home video from the 90s, you know, and obviously this comes first, but just that sense of, you know, loads of screens and people just typing away at them. There's definitely that influence, and it Oh, it's why I think a lot of the first serial feels more tropey now, but it's kind of actually you've kind of got to place it in that context of 1991 and computers being less common, less of a household thing, especially the idea of computers all being 
connected, you know, together. Um, like, yes, we're, you know, we're talking early internet again and in the same way that, you know, Press Gang does a story about the early internet and I think this doing it in obviously a very different context with the science fiction element and also not actually mentioning, you know, the internet or anything, but it's kind of, it's, it is interesting and it is one of these things where we have to kind of come to it thinking about it from the time rather than thinking about what this fe- it feels slightly derivative because actually it's, it's, it's there first before a lot of other things that are similar that come afterwards. Wow, a real nail bite of a series, that rats, wouldn't you say? Phew, it was so tense, my fur was standing on end. Yeah, it does look a little bit fluffed up at the moment. On the technology note, there's another really interesting Marcy line that's quite thematically uh, on... It's, it's, it kits the themes pretty hard. It's where she says, Paranoia is an intelligent form of common sense. None of us knows what's going on around us any of the time. I mean, look at this. She goes over to the light switch in the classroom. How many people know how a simple light switch works? She plays with the switch. We're all in the dark and it's getting darker. And then this is, I think that's really interesting. And then this, it's, I mean, that's alienation of technology. <laughs> She's tapping into all sorts of big stuff there. And it ties into Eldritch's thing where, you know, he has quotes like, the machine is a thing of truth in an inconstant age. If you care for the machine, if you respect the machine, if you love the machine, you may be a part of its truth. And people believe in the unseeable but will not see the unbelievable. Only the machine sees true. I am a creature of little imagination. I build what I can on the vanities and mistakes others leave behind. I draw together reins of power only to scatter them. The world will pass from light to dark. Chaos. Sweet eternal chaos. And he's got his theory that, you know, every thousand years civilizations go mad and wait for the world's end. So he's got all this kind of dark agey stuff. Though in the second serial with what he wanted to do with the behemoth, I started getting confused is does he want to plunge the world like into a new dark age you know that's a common sci-fi villain thing they want to you know wipe out the technology and everything and put humans back does he want that or does he just want to blow up the humans with the behemoth i was i was getting a bit confused by some of his dialogue uh what 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 or did his aims change between the two serials what do you think of his motivations yeah it's interesting because when he first comes back there he we obviously instantly get he has contrary aims to what the fascist character has. He's, you know, used them as a tool, but he wants something else. And I do think there is maybe a slight... I think it's still the idea of of, of chaos, but it's how he's invoking this chaos. Is he invoking this chaos by, you know, it seems like he's trying to persuade this computer to, you know, activate the weapons of the world. And by people... But it's also that line, as you say, about bringing together um, the reins of power just to let them go again to cause chaos you know it, it's kind of that would almost imply a, a different thing of like trying to um you know take control take on sort of authoritarian control through threat only to then get rid of that to see what effect they have on the world i think a lot of this has just got to be speculation because of the way it's written but it is interesting you could see that idea of chaos as being like he's going to you know use the weapons to force um you know Power, certain, maybe certain powers that have control out of the way so that then when he lets go of control as well, what's left would be much less structured and organised than society and would be more chaotic. That's funny because it's it stands in such contrast, like you were saying, where he's using the Nazis and you know, Pendragon's talking about the behemoth machine would have raised the British Isles out of shadow, great once more amongst the nations of the world. So they've, they, of course, want to use the behemoth in a super structured way to you know redesign society very rigidly and then eldritch it's is kind of there's kind of vagaries we can read into there and it's 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 literally the opposite of what they want order and he wants chaos it's i love that kind of we have a villain above the villain using the villains it's it's, it's a great little mix that complicates uh the the second serial it's interesting to think about the motivations there i also thought another bit of pendragon dialogue that interested me was when she's actually describing the behemoth and it's consider its genius random correlations pattern recognition logic pathways expanded heuristics free association list processing uh so it's a pretty cool computer <laughs> yeah some great words and it's again nice to have then um thomas kind of cut that dialogue down with his own kind of dismissive response of like oh well that makes everything clear then <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think the the specifics of Eldritch 
um, and his motivations, open parentheses, question mark, close parentheses, is, is sort of um, maybe not quite the point. <laughs> I think... It's no subtext. <laughs> uh, I, I think his super subtle name... <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think his super subtle name might be an indication that he's meant to be unknowable. Um, mm. But I really like the uh, the the line I think Marcy gets at the end, um, trying to figure out who he is, where she suggests that he's maybe just the worst of all bad men. Um, I think that's sort of all you need. <laughs> um, he's the bad one. You know, may, maybe you want to call him the devil. Oh, speaking of... Um, I, I think there's a, that line really sung in my head in harmony with, uh, a line from the Satan pit, hmm. um, which sits really, really prominently in my mind where Ada, I want to say, is that her name? Uh, s- says that the, the, she doesn't believe in the devil, only the things that men do. Mm. Um, which there's again this really strong uh, in a way it's gendered but it's also very um human despite the 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 eldritchness i suppose but of of both of them but oliver i thought russell didn't write the satan pit oh yeah yeah (laughs) sure sure yeah yeah, whatever (laughs) interesting one (laughs) <laughs> he he exerted an influence on it from <laughs> underground. A psychic influence. Um. A psychic influence. <laughs> other writers, other writers on Doctor Who waking up with scripts <laughs> written on their face in the mirror. <laughs> that was his method of show running. Uh, bringing, <laughs> bringing in Doctor Who into it. Uh, uh, Victoria Lambert, Marcy's actress, in the extras for the audiobook novelization she did she had a lot of interesting stuff to say actually uh like that she's a head of drama now like Bryn mentioned that's pretty cool but also she's the one that's really uh, kind of strong on the gun of drawing the doctor comparisons with Marcy and the doctor like she was you know in, in in you know in a fun tone and everything it's not like she's solemnly stating this uh but talking about her being the first conception of a female doctor in some ways and that she does consider herself a doctor who in lots of ways and talking of yeah. doctor who you mentioned Marcy's sort of a well, version of what you saw on uh, on screen. In, in with my the head, Doctor. it was Tom Baker. Mm. Yeah, number four. Yeah. So I, I, yeah, to an extent, I'm the you know the hidden Doctor. Mm. You know, you Russell's the, first. You know, I, I am the way. first female Doctor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I am. Um, and she she talks about how mealy some of Russell's dialogue was for her, but she's really big on these kind of Doctor Who connections because some of that is not easy to read. And you, I mean, you can read it without saying it out loud, but yeah. when you've got to say it out loud, you can't get your tongue around it. So, yeah, I think anyone that's going to write a book should be reading aloud what they're writing to make sure that it's going to kind of, you know, be easy to read by someone else. So basically you're telling Russell he needs to work on his dialogue. Sort it out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's great dialogue, isn't it? It oh, really is di- great dialogue, yeah, but um, it's, it's uh, you know, he should come and sit here and do it. I'll suggest that next time. <laughs> of that. And uh, also she's talking about, she's thinking about how Marcy might be autistic in the writing. Because I think, because she didn't get on with anyone, I wonder if there was a little bit of autism there. Mm. You know, I think, you know, she, she was, and she, and she didn't really pick up on emotions. She, she wasn't very emotional. She's very focused mm. on her task. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. But she, yeah, no, I expect she would have gone into intelligence of some kind, somewhere that she could be on her own. And she thinks maybe Marcy would have ended up as a spy or something and she kind of goes back and forth on which character she thought would end up as a teacher. Maybe Marcy would, maybe Reet would. Uh, she's not sure about Thomas. And I don't Mrs. know. Maitland. I sort of thought maybe she would go on and, and be a teacher, but she wouldn't have um, the patience. I think Reet ended up as a teacher. Mm. Thomas was a worry. Where was he going? Mm. <laughs> uh, so a lot of interesting thoughts there, but I think it's interesting that the actress is the one kind of uh, really linking in the Doctor Who things. Uh, that is interesting that it's not just a fan thing that we're projecting backwards, that she's considering what she got, you know, the dialogue she kind of got compared to what the dialogue, I guess, Equiston and Tennant got. Uh, I think that's quite interesting from her perspective. Yeah. 
And she also talks about being influenced by um, Tom Baker in particular as a Doctor performance, which, you know, I don't know how much that comes across, but obviously there's that kind of sort of scruffy shabbiness to it almost. And there's kind of, I guess, even like, you know, scenes like her, you know, forcing Thomas and Reed to engage with the computer, do the symbiosis thing when they're clearly, you know, that it's clearly something that's distressing for them. That kind of gives t- tones of, I think, the earlier um, Tom Baker performance. It's quite how, you know, much that goes into it, whether it is just, you know, uh, an offhand comment she's made. I do think it is interesting, but that was the doctor she picked and possibly that just says more about the sort of popular consciousness, you know, at the time of what Doctor Who was, that that's the one she picks up on. And obviously her, she would have been, I think, 19 at the time. So she would have been, you know, growing up with Tom Baker as as the Doctor, um, if she was 19 uh, when Dark Season was done in 1991. Um, it is interesting as well, I think, actually, coming out of that, just thinking about her being older than the actors who were playing Reet and Thomas, despite them playing the older characters. You know, again, in that same interview thing, she talks about how, you know, after filming, she could, um, you know, go to the um, bar with the um, crew and um, Kate Winslet and Ben Chandler could could not do that um, but <laughs> it's an interesting thing that I think in the performance you barely even notice I mean they all look you know very young but I think um, it kind of also speaks to I suppose the authority that Marcy's got to have as a character and actually as you pointed out the amount of kind of words and you know these complicated speeches she's got to get through it makes sense to cast that character older despite her being younger in the story i know it's i said so she was 19 yeah as as playing victoria so when she went for the audition reading she went in like with her hair in bunches and like all really dressing younger in her clothes to try and like take six years off her for meeting colin Kant, the director and also that since marcy's surname was hatter uh our victoria actress felt inspired to play the role with the madcap energy of the mad hatter uh, of, of Lewis Carroll. Uh, so, yeah, she's – you can feel that she ended up as a as a drama teacher than a head of drama, I think. She's got that kind of, uh, like us, the subtexty mind, I think. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm really glad she's back. I'm going to be interested to see what she does with the role now that she's gone from, you know, starting out as, you know, a young actor to a, a head of drama herself with all these – decades of teaching uh not so much of continuing acting the way she did in dark season itself but i think it'll be all an interesting cocktail to see how she approaches the role as an active acting not just what she did in the audiobook as you know uh, bringing to life a novelization yeah i mean i think she was she was excellent reading the audiobook and as well she also gets um a small part in the um in big finishes um version of um mind of a hodiac um, Rusty Davis's Doctor Who spec script as well, which is a lovely kind of bit of connection, you know, that she was the the lead in his um, first actual made drama, and now she gets to go back and also play a character in his first kind of written TV script now that that's been made, and obviously that will probably be from the, well, I mean, for certain it would be from the connection of Scott Hancock directing, as in the extras of Mind of a Hodiac, you know, Russell explains that he had no involvement in the casting of that whatsoever, but was, you know, very happy when he found out about people like Tania Miller and it's like a colliery of how with Dark Season he didn't have these producing powers and you know something's mm-hmm. turned out well like the behemoth he didn't have that with uh he's the big finish audios he's part of but Scott Hancock makes the magic happen anyway that's a nice little link that collaborative relationship between him and Scott Hancock throughout big finish you know with the sort of torchwood stuff that's been done over the last yeah kind of- yeah seven years is really fascinating and especially now in the light of Scott Hancock coming on to be script editor on Russell T. Davis's TV return to Doctor Who is um, interesting and how that, you know, relates to Dark Scene as well, as well seen as the sequel we're going to get will be, you know, directed by Scott Hancock. And I think they've clearly got a, both a great working relationship and a great sort of, you know, um, friendship. And I think that um, has enriched a lot of Big Finish over the last few years and has kind of presumably been what's persuaded Russell T Davies to the point where now he's actually writing you know a full script for this dark season because I know that when they were doing their Torchwood series five years amongst range you know there was again the conversation of would he direct a full script and you know just on a professional level he turned it down he just he said he couldn't so what's you know been able to change for the last few years I think 
we've got to probably give Scott Hancock a lot of credit for getting Russell, you know, confident enough and engaged enough with Big Finish that he's willing to actually dedicate his time to write, you know, an hour's worth of drama for them, not just kind of overseeing and inputting. It felt like a gift to me when there's like three-ish minutes of the tortured mm. audio season five finale that Russell wrote, and you can it, you you know that Russell wrote it. It feels like Russell, uh, and it's a very vital scene. But to go graduate from that to like him doing an hour, like, so this sequel season, it's it's four stories. It's uh, Spring by Tim Foley. I, I quite like him. Uh, a lot of mm. his stories. Summer by Chris Chapman. Autumn by James Goss, who's you know the huge deal, and Winter by the huge deal, uh, Russell himself. <laughs> so. Russell's doing the season two finale. It's going to be very exciting. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. And, you know, not just Russell's episode, but looking forward to see other people's take yeah. on that world. As, as we, we've we talked about a lot here, there is actually like a clear thematic through line, whether, um, you know, Russell wanted to in many of the time or not, there is a connection between those two existing serials. So it would be interesting to see how writers extrapolate from that to make stories that really feel a part of that world and in keeping um with what's come before and um yeah i'm really excited to see where it goes and they're all great writers i mean i'm the same as you with tim foley he's done amazing stuff since he came to big finish through yeah. their torchwood series five and you know even before that you know northwest footwear database and kind of podcast stuff is excellent and um yeah it's um it's a great roster of writers amazing cast i mean it, it really feels like you know big finish have put their all into it and i'm be interested to see how it Doors sort of with a popular audience because I suspect even with the Russell T Davies connection and the Kate Winslet, um, it's still something that's more ni- niche. But I imagine than a lot of their Doctor Who stuff. So I'm, I'm really interested to see how this does for them. Well, I know we'll be. I'm sure we'll reconvene in and around May 2023 to talk about season two because that's obviously of great interest to all of us. Dark season two. Are you, are you excited as well, Oliver? Bryn and I <laughs> just expressed excitement. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's interesting. I, I, I don't have the same um, sort of longer term uh, interest in the series that you two do. But having just watched um, the, the first run for this, I'm really excited to see how it's updated. I hope that... Um, it, it, there's a real art in maintaining the the very timely tone of the original, but also updating it. Yeah. Um, and I'm interested to see how that's done. I'm also, I am really interested in the four part structure, which is very different. Um, uh, while similar in a way in that the, the form of the original sort of slightly mirrors a bit of a school structure. Um, which this also does in 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 the the sort of terms of the year, although I suppose there aren't really four of them. Um, but interesting, I'm interested. Um, and having RTD write a full length big finish script is is a really interesting sign for Doctor Who, but also for what big finish are going to be able to do in the future and what kind of properties they'll be able to produce. And it is kind of speculating wildly here, but the the sense of them doing, you know, the names of the episodes being seasons, it does give a sense of a story that's going to be of a much kind of larger scope of what's in the TV series, given that what I find really interesting is both of those serials are just set up over a single day, you know, like especially the second one, you could easily do a version of that where, you know, there's the dig and they go, you know, back and forth, you know, it's one day and then the next, but it's really, those stories are really concentrated which leads to a fast pace where they feel like this is going to be, again, a completely different beast because it kind of, you know, we've got a change of medium, we've got 30 years in between, you know, there's, there's so much that will be different about this, but, you know, we've talked before about how it's going to be nothing like the planned second series that would have been in the 90s. And I think it'd be really interesting to see how it takes those differences, but also at the same time kind of owns that kind of, you know, brand of what it was originally. And of course as is often the case with Big Finish, you know, if we get four one-hour episodes, that means that this Big Finish interpretation version is already going to be longer than what we had um, on TV, which was less than three hours. And, you know, that's the case with Torchwood as, 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 as well. Now there's considerably more Big Finish Torchwood than there is television. That kind of just 
seems to be the way they they do you know even with class another doctor who yeah spin off you know it's it's interesting how big finish can kind of take something quite small and ends up expanding it well beyond its means and often more than doubling the content three people talking about dark season for two hours 2022 <laughs> it's a lovely thing i really like these these deep reaches back i i like getting to talk as well this is like just I, I like getting to talk on podcasts about things that aren't Doctor Who sometimes. Me, I mean, yes, yeah. We, we still talked an awful <laughs> lot about Doctor Who, but you know. It's different, yeah. <laughs> oh, I completely feel the exact same. Yeah, it's, I well, I'm always looking to dig around in the old shows of our showrunners, so yeah. Yeah. Alrighty, thanks everyone for listening. Please do share your thoughts about Dark Season as well, uh, as well as your perspectives and input into any of our Dark Season thoughts and our Dark Season opinions and Dark Season whatnot as well. What do you think of the show as Russell's first major individual work on TV? What worked for you with Dark Season? Did anything not work for you with Dark Season? Do you have any hopes and fears for Dark Season Legacy Rising, uh, the, uh, the inventively titled sequel in 2023? Uh, or did Dark Season remind you of anything else? And is there anything about Dark Season you think we didn't get to in our discussion? Let us all know, and thank you very much for listening in to our chat on Dark Season. Cheers.